without Mark Bernard today, man. Mark's a little busy, but uh, I couldn't pass this up, man. We'll do this again on the video version of the show for YouTube at Kevin Smith, youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. But this was so good, man. I was like, this is an audio story. Today we're going to... We're going to delve into, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I, I will bury the lead. I'm not going to tell them what it is. We're going to tell you a story about art. And, you know, fucking most of this stuff has its origins in the graphic arts. Before you can have a Batman v Superman movie, you got to have Batman comic books and stuff. And this is the source for all this material that's become multi billion dollar um, licenses, as they call them now. But, you know, back in the day, they were just comic book characters. This is a comic book story, man. Story about love of art. Now, before we dive into, there's multiple parts to this, I got to tell you this story to get to that story, which will then get us to that story. Um, Los Angeles, to me, isn't defined by, you know, things like, oh, there's the Hollywood sign, and there's fucking Groman's Chinese and stuff. My Los Angeles is the Los Angeles that, um, when I first came out here, like Circa Clerks, um, the things that I gravitated toward, the things that I love, like, oh, this is different. I couldn't find anything like this back home or something like that. So the really magic time in my life is when I move out here, and this was like 2002, with my wife and kid, and we get a house in Los Angeles, and I become an Angelino and stuff. I'd visited prior to that and stuff, but I became a resident and stuff. You dig into a place, and you're like, okay, well, I'm, I want to know where I want to go. You, know, you get five places you go all the time and shit like that to eat or to go see the movies and stuff or the things that you just love to do. And with the kid, you know, we were always shoving art in her face and stuff and, and buying art left and right and whatnot. So when I think of her childhood, I think of two places, um, Storyopolis, which was a kid's bookstore that, you know, one point was over on Robertson, then it moved to the Valley, sold a lot of original art, beautiful fucking artwork from kids books and stuff like that. Not quite hipster art, but just, you know, definitely like not mainstream art. And it usually related to children's literature. We got Dr. Seuss prints and stuff in the house from that place. Um, but the place that I spent an inordinate amount of time with, um, f- first by myself, then with my kid, then with anybody who's ever come to Los Angeles, like you must fucking go here is a place that, like, for years, we didn't quite know what the name of it was. So on the side of the building, it says Wacko. It says Soap Factory. It says Le Luz de Jesus. It's a colorful building uh, that's over in the, like, Las Vilas area that just by the look of it screams fun. Like, you just know. It's, you can't really see inside. But instantly, you're like, oh, my God, fucking paradise is inside the door. And it is. If you ever go to this place, man, aisles and aisles of just fun fucking shit to look at. It's like... When I was a kid, we'd go to the mall. We had a place called Spencer Gifts. And it was just like, oh, my God, this place is packed full of fucking cool weirdness and shit. But that was in a corporate fucking mall. Imagine if Spencer Gifts was even, you know, not in a mall and had a lot of Satan in it. Like, that's what fucking when you walk into this place, it's everything. It just feels like the fucking edge. There have been moments where I questioned my relevancy based on not being represented in the store, like our buddy Christ isn't here, our book isn't here, like, fuck, we didn't make it into this joint. In this joint, man, hand in hand with all the art books you could look at and all the art you could buy and shit, like all the toys and tchotchkes and shit, there's a gallery. And I've always gone to the gallery because they, they showcase not just local L.A. artists, but artists from outside of the area. But the shows are always the edge. The art is always the fucking edge, man. In a town that's full of fucking edge, you don't see fucking more striking, like outside the box, wonderful art than you see it in the gallery part of the Le Luz de Jesus. That's the gallery part of, of that giant wacko soap factory um, complex. Go through the store and there's a fucking art gallery, man. And it's a serious, like hardcore art gallery where over the years I would take the kid and I would just shop. Like, you know, there's, these are the days where I had money, but it's just like, you know, I had studio deals. So I was like, what do I do with all this overhead money? You invest into art and, and fucking this art was amazing. A lot of it's still in the kids room. A lot of it's still in our house to this day and stuff. Pieces that I bought and gave away. It was one of my favorite pieces of all time. Like he, we have the piece. Remember he did full talk about it. You can tell me later on his name, but did the fuck girl like arms crossed and she's going fuck. And he did the devil girl head sculpture, but he did that awesome painting of Jesus in a fucking convertible with three angel demon chicks, like big titted and stuff like that. Just 
every sacrilegious. Like I saw this piece of artwork. I was like, fuck, that should have been the dogma poster. So this, this place, La Luz, been like home. When, when I, when I thought of leaving, like where I grew up and leaving New Jersey, like the thought of moving to Los Angeles was repugnant to me. And I did it for love because my wife wanted to be here. I was like, fucking Los Angeles, man. There's nothing for me there. I East Coast, but one of the things that made it easier was going to that fucking place, man. I was like, well, you know what? We wouldn't have this in fucking Red Bank. Like, this is fucking unique. This is wonderful. And it is Los Angeles to me. If you're ever in Los Angeles and you fucking don't make a visit here, you've wasted your trip to Los Angeles. Skip looking at fucking star footprints and fucking fake stars on the ground. Go see some fucking living, breathing art. This place is hipper than you will ever be in your life. And that's probably not the word to use anymore at this day. But I made – here – I mean, this ain't braggy, but I made clerks. So, like, I'm ensconced and hipped them forever. And I walk into that place and I feel like an old man. And I always did. I walk in always feeling like a nerd, like, I don't belong here. Place is the fucking edge, man. You'll lose hours. I've lost hours. And they're not lost because it's well spent. In the gallery, bought a lot of fucking stuff. When I think of that gallery, I think of good times. I think of my kid growing up and stuff. She always asked, let's go here. So, we're shooting this uh, pilot for the show called Hollyweed. And, you know, we have a scene where I'm playing one of the characters and my kid is played by my kid. So, you know, at one point I'd written for like, they're walking through Larchmont, which is something I'd never fucking done with my kid ever. And one of the first rules of fucking writing is like, you know, unless you're writing fucking Star Wars, you know, what would really happen? Like, that's what makes good fucking comedy, good drama and stuff. And so we would never go fucking walking through Larchmont, but we would go fucking walking through La Luz. So, I, you know, we're sitting there doing production meeting. I said, you know, we're shooting Los Angeles, man, which is a rare fucking bird these days to begin with. I was like, I, one of the fucking places that I love and I never see in movies or TV shows is La Luz de Jesus. And Laura Greenlee, who's a producer on it, like she knew it's all like, oh, La Luz. Like it's something everybody fucking loves, but when I watch a lot of things set in Los Angeles, I don't. And I ask my wife, and she consumes every piece of fucking media, man. I'm like, do you ever see Eli Luz and stuff? And she's like, no, like, not really. And so, so I said, hey, man, reach out. I mean, chances are they're going to say no, because I don't see it in a lot of things. But can you see if maybe we could shoot a scene there? And God damn it, if they didn't say yes. And the re- they said, uh, yeah, they know you, you've spent money there. I was like, God, it pays to fucking be invested in art, man. So we went to Location Scout, and I saw and re-met a dude I've known for years who I always see at the fucking place when I've gone there. Great soul by the name of Matt Kennedy. Matt Kennedy is one of those brilliant people who supports the fucking arts. He showcases artistry. My life has been enriched by the fact that this dude finds blank walls to put up fucking brilliant artwork, man. He's dialed. In. Again, I don't want to use the word hip because people are like, that's not a hip word anymore. Whatever the word is, man, the edge, whatever the fuck, he's on it. And, and his fucking place in, this, in, in Los Angeles is ensconced forever as a place where you go where that's where art fucking lives and breathes. And real art, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, like all art's great, but I'm talking about shit like pieces that blow your fucking mind back. But they're also pieces that are themed to like the, our world and the shit we care about, like pop culture art but not like you know fucking here's a soup can which is also valid i ain't taking anything away from that but i'm telling you like it's a it's a singular experience you can go online right now Where, where's the address where could they go la luz de jesus.com go la, la, you know if you can't spell that shame on you for your <laughs> spanish students who went to high school um go online and just fucking look man or you just hit la luz enter la luz and do images man you'll be shown a world of artwork that'll mind fuck you man there are pieces that i've seen there's a piece that i bought in that fucking store it hangs at jane and bob secret stash the alan moore seance piece yeah. Yeah. one of the most brilliant fucking pieces of artwork i've ever seen it's got alan moore having a seance with like the minutemen characters the charlton, the watch- characters. The charlton yeah. characters become the watchman and i brought it to wall flanagan speechless i was just like look look at this this is los angeles like oh it's so fucking beautiful so i've known matt for a little while while we were scouting matt told me a story that he told me before and i was like and i said the same thing i said last time which is like god damn it dude this needs to be set on fat man and batman yeah. it's fucking brilliant and here we are. So first off, man, tell us a little bit about yourself. How the fuck do you wind up opening that place? Well, um, I came to work for Billy Shire, who's the guy who owns La Luz de Zeus mm-hmm. and So Plant and Wacko. So you worked at that place? Yeah. At the, at the counter? Yeah, I got So you're like there. one of those fucking people that I walk in and be like, 
black dude's cooler than me. <laughs> Seriously, like everybody there, like they're not shitty to the people mm-hmm. that come in, but there's just a, like there's an aura about them. Like, mm-hmm. oh my god, these fucking. I mean, I I know it's like weird because like I I like I'm Silent Bob, so there should be an aura about me. But I bend a knee to the fucking clerks at that place. You know, I was a clerk for a long time in my life. Yeah. Nobody ever walked into a quick stop or any store I worked at and was like, this guy's the edge. You know, they were like, this guy's fucking, there's no edge. He's all fucking round curves and shit. You walk into that place and you always feel like, fuck, man, these cats, they know what the time it is. Fingers on a pulse and shit. Um, I can't believe you were one of those cats. Dude. Yeah. I mean, I was one of those guys too, like you, that was, I was a clerk at a comic shop in a video store. Where? And, um, originally back in, um, in Lynn, Massachusetts. Is that where you're born? Yeah. Where is that yeah. near in relation to Boston? Boston. It's 20 minutes north of Boston, right next to Salem. Oh, right on, yeah. man. So, you know, in, in junior high school, you know, we'd, we'd spend a lot of time at Gallows Hill in, in Salem where they, you know, they hung the witches. And it was a really kind of cool thing man, to man, do. Man, 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 <laughs> metal, metal. Um, how adorable is that? Yeah. So We um, live near witch history. And, I like, know. if you like witches in America, there's only really, like, one place. The capital of witchdom is Salem. And they didn't dial that in until after I left. Like, it wasn't until the 1990s that they really figured out, hey, it's Salem, Massachusetts. We should be the Halloween capital of the world. Yeah, we should market to this. Yeah, Let's it took brand. forever. It took, uh, um, what was it, you know, seven, 1697 to <laughs> 1994. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, um, I worked at a place called uh, Comics, Legends, and Lore. Where is that? It was in downtown Lynn. Still exists? No, it's gone. But the original owner, Tim Cole, opened up a place called Cole's Comics. Mm-hmm. And that's still there. And he's kind of like a local legend among, you know, Tom Snagoski was a kid who started going to that shop. And he became, he's a few years older than me. He was the first guy I knew that wrote comics. Um, Paul Marcure, who was the manager there. And um, Paul Glavin were always working on stuff together. And so there was this whole kind of community of these slightly older guys that were super cool to a guy like me who just like rode into my BMX one day and was like, what is this paradise that I've just walked into? <laughs> comics are worth money. What is this? You know? And had you been a collector or just a reader at that point? I had been a reader. I don't think you could call me a collector because I wasn't putting stuff in plastic bags at mm. that point. But I remember. But you hold on them or give them away? Like I, when you were done reading I them. kept everything. I mean, I was that kid that my parents would buy me Star Wars toys and I kept the boxes like neatly pressed oh, under the toy box. Oh, you're a smart kid. Yeah. So when I came out to LA, that paid my rent. Yeah, no doubt. Fuck, <laughs> smart. But yeah, it was uh, um, a cool experience work, you know, uh, learning from those guys. There was an episode of Simon and Simon that had, it was all comic book based and the mystery to the comic to this real life murder was solved in a comic book. And this is like circa 1980s. 85 maybe. Or so it's like, <gasps> yeah. as a comic book fan, like, yeah. oh my God, they're, sh- everybody shut up. They're talking about us. <laughs> yeah. And it was the first time I realized that a number deep in the run could be worth more than say number one. You know, and, and at that point in the 80s, you know, who knows what you got at the newsstand. You, you get like a, you know, a, a poly bag of like 10 comics yeah. and, and they totally fool you. They'd be like Spider-Man on one side and maybe Batman on the other side. And then Shit in the middle, in the middle. Was garbage. <laughs> you know, it was like Harvey comics and, you know, terrible Archie's not when it was relevant like it is now. And, um, but crazy how Archie bounced. Yeah. I mean, the, Archie's maybe one of the, you know, kind of the most relevant hippest comics out there, I think. now. Yeah, and do you think it was the moment they ditched the Dan DiCarlo look? They were like, finally, now we get fucking sore. I don't know. It kind of still looks a little bit like that to me, but I also think that, you know, things like the Henry and Glenn comic had come out parodying that look and connecting with, um, with, you know, music fans and people that like pop culture. Um, what is Henry and Glenn? (laughs) Henry and Glenn is a comic book about the fictional stress, fictional, um, romance between Henry Rollins and Glenn Danzig (laughs) in which their next door neighbors are Holland Oates who are (laughs) <laughs> and Rob Halford works at the local leather store. <coughs> Whose book is it? Oh my God! It's the, they call themselves Igloo Tornado, and it's um, a bunch of people: um, Matt Gardaki and Tom. Oh my gosh, Tom who does um, the humans, and um, just a bunch of these guys, and they all did separate comics in different looks. So when Tom does the, the cover, sometimes he'll do a cover that looks totally like rob leefield and sometimes he'll do it totally like you know mac Rayboy world war ii era comic and of course glenn Danzig is not a fan of it at all why <laughs> not a sense of humor he doesn't have a sense of humor about that i guess but um did they 
even know each other in life? Were they friends or? Yeah, there's a lot of pictures, you know, back in of the early. Rollins um, and Danzig? And Danzig, Black Flag and Misfits played shows together. Really? Yeah, yeah. So why, So it's just like, this is as random as like, and I was going to say an SNL sketch, but it's even fucking more like deep cuts inside. It's obscure. almost abstract, you know, because you've got like these, <laughs> like the two super macho guys you know, from rock and roll and heavy metal and punk. Mm. And that because it's, because they're so clearly not gay, it would be funny, right. you know, that no, no, no one could ever confuse this reality type of thing. Right. And, um, and yeah, so the, I, Tom told me a story about being on a plane next to Erie Vaughn and them hitting it off and then him having to explain that he was the guy behind. Who's Erie Vaughn? From the Misfits. And, oh, really? Yeah. So he had to be like, I was, I did the comic. Yeah. And then it was like, 45 minutes of silence until they land. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So wait, so uh, Archie, we, we derailed with Archie for, <laughs> for a little bit. Cause yeah. I was like, Archie's relevant, but he <laughs> is man. They're trying to make a TV show. They're fucking... See, this is like, as you talk about, we talk about comics on the show a lot, mm-hmm. but as you can hear fucking Matt is not like, Hey man, did you read flash? Like, <laughs> Matt knows the shit that you'll discover in 10 years and be like, this is a real thing. Yeah. Like you see it all, man. I, I, I've been really lucky, you know, and I think that, you know, part of, I felt like you felt when you first walked into Wacko. Right. And um, I had just moved out here in like 1990 and from Massachusetts, um, from Massachusetts. Did you go to college? I did a little bit of college, yeah. Where? Uh, Emerson. And, um, you went to Emerson? Yeah. I spoke at Emerson yeah. once, man. I, I hung out at Emerson a lot. I can't say that really. <laughs> <laughs> I walked past it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'd gone to Salem State and then um, decided I was going to try and maybe go to film school. And I came out to LA and, you know, it really, I just crashed my car in the snow and I'm like, I'm done with this. Really? Yeah. Fuck Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to vote for Bill Weldon and leave, <laughs> you know, type of thing. Like, the hell with them. But um, I came out and we we just couldn't find jobs. My, my lifetime best friend since kindergarten, and you moved out with your best friend. Yeah. Oh my god, you're breaking my heart. What a sweet adventure. Yeah. Are you still buddies? Um, now on Facebook because he moved back pretty soon afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what a sweet adventure. <laughs> like it ended pretty quick. You abandoned me in Los Angeles. <laughs> no, no, he he actually did really well in music, and <clears throat> um, I started getting much more involved in in art and in the Hollywood kind of aspect. Now, could of, you so. ever create art yourself? Can you draw? Can you paint? Can you? I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of ability in a lot of different disciplines, but what I learned early on, and of course I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was younger. Right. It was my dream, you know, and I could copy a lot of stuff, but I was never satisfied with what I did or I was instantly satisfied. And so there was no growth. <laughs> like, look what I've done. I've just drawn the best picture of oh my God. Bernie Wright's I think you've thing. just defined me in a way that nobody else has. I think that's who I am. I'm like, yeah. I'm done. This is great. People yeah. are like, no, it's not. Keep going. Yeah, I'm dropping microphones that aren't plugged in, you know, at the age of 10. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I, I realized pretty quickly that there were people that were a lot better at this than I was. Mm. And, um, and then there was the guys that were a little bit older that were starting to successfully kind of integrate themselves into, into comicdom. And Snagoski was a huge influence because he was the guy that we knew that made it. And what did he do? What was his first big gig? The first thing he did was like Swords of Sharpe, which was like this independent comic um, about a Sharpe dog that was like a samurai. Right. And then um, he he got a gig with, um, I think it was Michael Golden, and he started doing The Punisher when Wrightson was on The Punisher too. Wow. And like he kind of paid his dues and started doing mainstream comics. And then he wrote a series of children's book or, or young adult fiction, which has done pretty well for him. What is it? Um, something he, he did the BPMD with. Um, oh, I've seen, I remember that, the, the symbol. I've seen that symbol. Yeah. And that was um, out of Hellboy. And he's yeah, done yeah, some yeah. stuff for that. And I think he did some stuff with, um, with Concrete maybe even too. And so like a lot of the kind of really great stuff that wasn't exactly mainstream that became mainstream. And he's the nicest guy in the world. And, and you like, knew him. Yeah. More importantly, you're like, I knew this human being yeah. and now this human being does this thing. Yeah. And so Steve Bissett's um, first wife, I think was from Lynn or from Swampscape or someplace around there. Steve Bissett for the uneducated is? The guy behind Swamp Thing with Alan Moore, that whole really big creative team. One of and, my favorite fucking talents on the planet because I love that Alan Moore run of Swamp Thing. Yeah. changed my fucking life. Like the way some people are like, the you know catcher in the ride to find my child that that fucking run of comics like when i think of comics as the first image comes to mind oddly enough not batman but steven sets alan moore swamp thing yeah oh and that guy he he knows 
something about everything. And he's really versed in, in film and in comics history. And as a 12, 13 year old kid, you know, meeting Steve Bissett, it was amazing. And, um, you know, Steve Bissett, for those unfamiliar with comics history, drew the anatomy lesson, right? Yep. One of the greatest, single greatest fucking comic book magic tricks. Ever. Number one, one of the single pieces of greatest of literature ever mm-hmm. produced. Magic trick because it rebooted a pretty cool concept into a fucking brilliant concept. It took a monster and turned it into Shakespeare. Yeah. Nuts. Crazy good. Um, and redefined comic books. After that, comic books would grow the fuck up in yeah. a big, bad way, super fast. That's the birth of, of what became Vertigo. Yeah. Maybe 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was such a, just a really great person. And meeting him, he was the first piece of published comic book art I ever bought. And I worked the whole summer to kind of pay it off. Type What'd of you thing. buy? How much, what was it? First was, off, what was it? Page from what? It was a, um, an unused cover to Swamp Thing 40. Holy fuck. So it's like the American Gothic with, yeah. the, with the flag in back. That got stolen uh, in the early 90s. And I've, I've never come across it or else I'd have it again. Because I mean, that's the, the thing. Guy. It's like you'd be like, you! And you would know <laughs> yeah. who had it. Wait a sec. So what did a cover cost? What year is this? This is 1984. Five. What does an unused cover cost in 1985? What did you pay for? I think it was $600. Holy, that's fucking higher than I would have imagined for that period in time. He's like, fuck you. I know I'm good. (laughs) Well, it wasn't from him directly. It was through the shop. Really? So they had probably a little bit built in, but also that the access to shops that weren't like in LA or weren't in New York City to original comic book art was so limited that it just automatically got more expensive in Massachusetts. Good point. Good point. And so he lived in Vermont and he was from Vermont. And, um, you know, he also developed Constantine was a character that really him and Tottlebin yeah. had developed outside of Alan Moore a little bit. And you can see stuff that goes back to the work that they did at Scholastic. And they were part of that first graduating class at the, um, the Kubert School. Really? Yeah, them, Tom Mandrake, um, Tom Yeats. Um, and God, then, these names, like, I'm, these names are figures of my, you know, fucking comic youth. Yeah. That I assumed when I was a kid were old men. <laughs> yeah. And apparently they were not. No. Apparently they were fresh out of fucking school. But they had stuff. beards, you know, so they, they also looked older. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm the same age as you. So it's like, you know, it, was, it had that impact to me of like, oh, my God. And when I met Bill Sankiewicz, I expected he was going to be like 65. Yeah. And he was this young, like, party animal crazy guy. <laughs> and we had him in a signing at Comics, Legends, and Lore or at Corner Bookshop. And what, we, what year is this? This is right during Moon Knight. So like it's pretty straight toasters. Three, yeah, oh yeah. It was before Electro Assassin. So it was, oh my God, this is deep. Yeah. Maybe like right at the beginning of his new mutants run. Huh. And um so we talked Phillips Book Shack into um splitting the bill with us because he was from out of town. So we were like, Well, I'll tell you what, you know, if you pay for lodgings and food and stuff, we'll pay to fly him in. And it turned out to be the smartest decision because he turned in like a seven hundred dollar bar bill <laughs> for uh, for them, it, and not because he was consuming it, but he bought drinks for everybody. Right, right. He's Very generous. Really, dude. Awesome Can't guy. really do that on the plane. Right, plane fee is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, having that stuff happen, and then like watching the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guys kind of self publish and explode. And they came out of that area. Yeah, Eastman and Laird were for what from Massachusetts. I think they were from. Um, either Connecticut or Rhode Island. He built that museum where? In Northampton. Northampton. That was in Massachusetts. Yeah. That's why I've got the Massachusetts thing in my yeah. head. That was, uh, Kevin did that. Yeah. Um, which was an awesome place. Yeah. I've been there. Gone now, I believe. I think it's still there. I'm not sure if he has as much involvement behind it. They, really? And they've built up like the, the Massachusetts MOCA is now in Northampton. It's the largest museum of contemporary art, like area wise in the country. Really? Yeah. Wow, well, fucking that was, and that didn't exist prior. No, and that's like this is very close to the border in New York, so it's past Springfield. It's it's up close to Vermont. It's mm. like it's it's closer, I think, even to New York City than it is to to Boston, and it's very close, you know, to the Buffalo area. But um, so it's really it's not in a metropolis. If if you've ever been to Western Massachusetts, it's it's kind of like Southern Jersey. Yeah, I've been, I've been, Northampton is kind of buried, nestled, and it's yeah. not like, there's a major metropolitan, but it was like a college town. Is there yeah. a college there? Amherst is nearby. That's it. I remember it was a big fucking school. Party there. school of all party schools. Is it really? Yeah. The, um, all right, so fuck, you knew famous people. 
when you were a kid yeah and famous in our world like, yeah you know you, you couldn't you couldn't it had be no like, cachet to get you late <laughs> and you couldn't be like dad i met bills and kevin like, <laughs> yeah. so what yeah <laughs> mow the yard yeah but uh, in our world it's like holy fuck and yeah. it's certainly enough to make a kid go like these people are real they're not just names on a fucking page i met these people yeah this like exists that. oh wow this is what the art looks like before it gets published and i think that was the big eye opener to me and i'm like i'm not that good and so I really, so you people. were seeing pencils and being like, fuck, I give up. Look at this fool's pencils. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I turned, I changed direction immediately. I'm the other guy. I'm like, yeah, I suck, but I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> there's a lot to be said for that. And I think I've developed that as I got older is that, um, I stopped kind of caring about those types of comparisons. Yeah. And so, Oh my God, you go, you drive yourself crazy comparing yeah. yourself to a fucking Bilson Cabbage. Well, yeah. Well, forget it. I'll never be that good. Yeah. That'd be like me comparing myself to like a Quentin Tarantino. It's just like yeah. he makes movies and I make movies, but it's not really the same thing. <laughs> but he's one of us too. You know, it's like when I first came out to LA and I worked at that, I got a comic book shop job because I sold my comic book collection to them mm. to move back home. So you sold it. You were like, fuck this. I'm going back. Yeah. Like I, I can't find a job. I can't work. And my cousin was who had been out here at the time was working at Disney. I think said, why don't you get a job at that shop? You just sold your collection to. And so I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. Totally. And I approached him. I'm like, can you manage your collection. <laughs> yeah, you want me to price all these? I think it's 20,000 comics I just sold you. And the guy that owned it was this British guy who was obsessed with the Boston Celtics. And so I went back and I got him. Um, I tracked down the ability for him to get an original Larry Bird jersey. And, and he chose, he opted not to. It was expensive, but he was impressed with my ability to do that. And I became the, the card counter guy because a lot of shops at that point had cards. Had cards. And so the people that came in were like, you know, James Earl Jones came in, you know, and this guy. Where was know, the store? It was on Highland. Now that area is completely gone, but it's called Fantastic Store. And it had this giant paper mache thing from the Fantastic Four that hung over it. And across the street at that what time, year is this? this is early 90s. Wow. It's like 90. I mean, it was in existence before I came out here, but it was like 90 to 96, maybe, I think. And then there was a Burger King next door that all got bought up. Across the street was a Holiday Inn that got turned into the Renaissance and then that whole Hollywood and Highland structure. Really? Yeah. But they shot True Romance at that shop. Fuck, I have a vague memory of this fucking place. Yeah. Black, but the thing. Yes, yes, yeah. it was black. Yeah. That's where they shot fucking True Romance? Yeah, it's supposed to be Detroit. I was in that store once. Yeah. Once. Yeah. And I remember going back looking for it years later because when I moved out here, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I know where there's another comic book store because I knew Meltdown. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, Gaston Bill's and I Apple. worked there and he opened Meltdown. I helped him build the first Meltdown. We were roommates. The fuck? Yeah. Really? Yeah, so Gaston was the guy that we became roommates of at, when we first came out to L.A., and Which so, is, by the way, like, you know, like most people listen to podcasts, very familiar with Meltdown because yeah. of Nerd Melt and stuff like that. But if you're unfamiliar with like, you know, I, of course I will, um, I'll be like the world's most famous comic book store is Jane Silent Bob's Secret <laughs> Stash. But the world's best comic book store may very well be Meltdown. It is a fucking fabulous store. It's pretty impressive. Uh, like it's beyond just comic books. It is celebrates uh, everything that you love about this genre, but not just fucking like, you know, superheroes are one part of it and they don't fucking push them under the rug and shit. Like some indie stores, mm -hmm. they definitely embrace them, but it, they're just like, this medium has so much more. And what is it? What's the name? Is it Gaston? Gaston Dominguez. Yeah. He, uh, you know, fucking built a gallery. Yeah. I remember early back in the day going back to the store. What's this? He's like, we're going to showcase art. And I was like, that's fucking clever. Yeah. And I remember, Hardwick came over when they did Nerdist at Smod Castle. Yeah. He was like, This is a good idea, having your own space to do shows in. And he wrote an article somewhere. And he was like, First thing I did was I went over to Gaston and said, Can we do Nerdist shows here? He's like, I want my own theater. And they built it into fucking the um, Nerdist Empire. Meltdown. The whole Nerd Nerdist yeah. Empire begins in the back of fucking Meltdown. Yeah. So um, yeah, this store is if you're in Los Angeles, man, fucking it's a fantastic story. I mean, when I was a kid, when I first came out here, Golden Apple was the shit. Yeah. I saw it on television, bitch. Yeah. Like, I remember they did a Batman report on Entertainment Tonight, 1989. Mm -hmm. And they were like, they interviewed Bill Leibowitz. Yep. And he was in a comic book store. And he was like, you know, this is going off the shelves. And I remember like, move, fucker, because I wanted to see the rest of the store in the shop behind him. <clears throat> when I first went out to Los Angeles, 
first place I wanted to go to, I was like, I want to go to this Golden Apple. Yeah. And I met that dude. And I was like, dude, I saw you on TV. And he's like, when? And I was like, in 1989 yeah. in New yeah. Jersey. You're fucking famous. Because he was talking about how Batman was doing well. Yeah. So um, the next, like a couple of years later, Nerd Melt would, I mean, uh, Meltdown would open up. Yep. What year did they open? Now we moved. Um, I left Fantastic Store with a little bit of fanfare. Why well, a little um, bit of fanfare? The owner left town and his, his wife um, was in charge and we were all getting paid like five bucks under the table, which was lower than minimum wage. And we all worked 10 hours a day, mm. seven days a week. Like it was, um, it I was believe like, they call that slave labor. It was a sweatshop. Yeah, pretty much. And it was the 4th of July and I was, I wanted to go to a barbecue and I was like, nobody's coming in. Like there's nobody coming in the store right now. Can we just close early? And she came back and she started like counting out the register and, and like all this ridiculous stuff and, and started on this, this speech like, well, if you don't want to work here, you don't have to work here. And I grabbed the keys and I threw them to the end of the store. I called her a very unkind name and I walked out and the, um, your, your fucking mass hole came out. <laughs> yeah, my mass hole came right. I was like, <laughs> fuck sometimes you. the Lynn just comes out and it's just like, fuck you, and fuck you. But the, um, I end, I quit, and then when the owner of the shop came back, Jago, he actually hired me back immediately. He actually asked me if I would come back to work. Right. And I was like, yeah, I'll come back. And I, I think that lasted a month. And at that point, um, Gaston was starting to think it was time to open up his own shop. Now, in that time, so he had worked at Fantastic Shop. Yeah, yeah, he was he was at Fantastic. So he store. learned how to do retail at somebody else's store, and then he finally moved into it. And was and was Meltdown that same location always? No, it was originally across the street next to. I remember that yeah. man like yeah it was, and it actually moved two spaces across the street it started out in this down the thin other area yeah. next to like this bad Thai place not toy which is great right but this other, other place called is. like Thai magic or something and um and then we we moved it <laughs> who we just lost as a sponsor fuck you <laughs> <They're> <laughs> we're as good as toy <laughs> they're out of, they're out of business. <laughs> but uh then he moved down and it, and it got bigger and then um they moved into an area and this is this is kind of ironic and it's it's funny in very black humor kind of way it was this famous children's um, furniture store called Sid's. <laughs> Buy your crib at, <laughs> at Sid's. Sudden, at sudden infant death syndrome. <laughs> and it was there forever. And nobody, of course, nobody bought any furniture there, but it's a huge space. <laughs> it's too depressing to buy and furniture. <laughs> Change the name. <laughs> yeah. And it became available and um, they moved across the street. And um, so I'd help build out the first meltdown. Mm. And then. Um, but always on sunset, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I was in that same block. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. But I, had, I had since gotten hired at at Soplant and um, was working the counter downstairs. How before. often had you gone there? Was that like just a place you shopped at? I had no idea it existed until I left that job at Fantastic Store, and this dude that lived in the building was like, "Oh, you should check out. You're always talking about art. You should check out this this gallery down on Melrose." And I was like, "What's Melrose?" And um, my whole life was on Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard. Right. And I didn't have a car. So, of course, you know, and, and um, like long haired, like rocker types. And we were just hanging out the Sunset Strip and stuff. So um, this dude was like, yeah, hop in the back of the bike. And, you know, I took the, the, the backseat of his bike down to Melrose and walked in this place. And I was like, oh, my God, like every book you'd ever want to buy at that point. And this is before Tashin was like a really big deal, like, mm. I think. I found out later that that store sold more Tashin books than anybody worldwide. Really? At that point. And then they're like, oh, the gallery's upstairs. And you walk around past the newsstand on the side street on Martell and you go up those stairs. And it was like, you'd smell the incense and you'd see the weird stuff. And then you get to the top of the stairs and there's like a bone case on one side. And there was like this folk art on the other side and these amazing books and these cases with crazy stuff. And then you look forward and there was like obviously an art gallery mm -hmm. with all these windows that lined Melrose. And they had a, um, a tarp was up like halfway up, like a show was coming down. And the girl that was behind the register was actually the very first girl I ever saw with like a complete tattooed sleeve. Oh, like, and fucking, that would be like, Jesus, look at this freak. <laughs> no, her fucking arms got amazing, tattoos all over. It's something you'd see every day now. This but amazing at that point, looking like, girl, yeah. Oh, my God, it's a circus animal. Look at this. This is <laughs> but it, it, and a she sleeve, was, your first sleeve. Yeah, and she was totally pierced up. What in year? 1990, 91. Yeah, that would be frightening in 91. It was amazing. And, and she was so <laughs> nice. And, and, and she was like, oh, I was like, who's who's showing right now? And she's like, oh, uh, Joe Coleman show's coming down. And I had tried to go to the Joe Coleman show at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts where he went bananas and like 
was like biting the heads off of mice and exploding and stuff. And the cops got called and there was a warrant written out for his arrest. And my friend Joel and I actually went to it, but we got there late and we only saw the aftermath. And, um, <laughs> like everyone's running. What happened? Yeah. It's like, this must have been great. And um, <laughs> We missed the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and so she, she's telling me, she's like, oh, you know, the, the, the paintings are on the wall right now. They're going to come down, but you can go look. And so I walked behind, literally walked behind the curtain and saw these amazing pieces and you know, mind blown. I walked out. She's like, Oh, you're going to go to the performance tonight. And I was like, where's that at? She's like, Oh, it's down on the, um, it's down on the Santa Monica pier. I'm like, what time's that at? She's like, Oh, it's going to be at eight o'clock. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go to that. And so, um, they were getting ready kind of to close, I think. And I walked downstairs and then I just walked to the bus stop and just took the bus to Santa Monica to go to this thing, not knowing like what was involved. And it was just like this free form performance that he did where he strapped like explosives to his chest. Who? Joe Coleman. Really? Yeah, it was crazy. So the dude that you couldn't see in Massachusetts. Did the same exact thing out in public in Santa Monica. <laughs> and, and Billy was there, Billy Shire, who owns the gallery and owns Wacko. Mm. And, um, and I saw him and I saw a few other people and Robert Williams, I think might've even been there. And, um, I went, the next day back and asked for an employment application. I filled it out at Double Rainbow, which was then on Melrose. It's kind of coffee shop ice cream place. So wait, it La Luz and Wacko started on Melrose? Yeah. Actually, um, Wacko, yeah, they actually both started on Melrose in the early 80s. Soap Plant goes back to Echo Park in 1971. So that building that they're in now, which I've they've been in feels like over 20 years. Since 1995. So 20 years exactly. Yeah. Prior to that, they were elsewhere? Yeah, we're on Melrose. So my version is only the, the version it's ever been. Yeah. yeah. But you were at OG. Yeah. Holy fuck. Why did they move? Um, Melrose became Melrose. You know, the, the rent started going up and the chain store started moving. Gap moved in, you know, places like that. And um, back then, th- that's where Golden Apple was on Melrose, almost directly yeah. across the street from Hollywood High School. Yeah. Yeah. And um, even that was the they, original Golden Apple, the one yeah. they showed in that fucking entertainment, and that's where I'm. Uh, that's where my wife, like, I've got ties to that building. Yeah, my wife interviewed me for USA Today, and then she came to see me at the signing, and and uh, so like whenever I'd run into the Leibowitzes, like their house got damaged, I think by an earthquake or mm-hmm. some such shit, and they lived at that hotel, the Bellage, for a long fucking time. Wow. Whenever I'd come into town with my, with Jennifer. We'd stay there. Kitty Corner from the Viper Room. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you'd always be like, that's where River Phoenix died, yeah. you know, uh, you know, legendarily. But Bill Leibowitz would always be at that, that fucking joint, man. And he would be like, oh, it's you guys. Because he remembered. He's like, this was the journalist that was looking for you that day. How did you land this? Like, <laughs> he was very, he was very blunt and stuff. I like <laughs> that was, yeah, Leibowitz was a little blunt. But the, the. I ended what up was back. the what? Take me into the the nineties comic book retail relationship in Los Angeles. Did they did Fantastic Shop not like Bill? Oh, nobody liked Golden Apple like, because they were the big one. They were the they were the big dog, and I'm <laughs> sure that that's the way Meltdown is now. But like, um, that you'd go to Golden Apple and everything seemed a little bit expensive, right? You know, and if you absolutely had to have it, you could get it at Golden Apple. You know, you'd like drop your head in shame and, and walk <laughs> in and, and pay the money. And, and maybe Bill All would say right. something mean to you. But um, but I think his wife was Sue. Um, I remember she sold um, an Amazing Fantasy for um, $15. Amazing Fantasy? <laughs> for 15 For 15 bucks. For 15 bucks. By accident? By accident. Like she didn't see the zeros on the side of it. And The fuck? Yeah. And and he stayed married. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. They, what a good guy. They had so much expensive stuff that they could sell. So Yeah, please. Oh, my God. You don't. You don't understand, kids, unless you walked into it. Like, boy, you fucking captured it expertly, though. Especially the Bill might say something mean to your part. He was kind of saucy. Yeah. Um, but, man, it's I guess it's kind of like a little bit dialed down from what Meltdown is. Meltdown yeah. is a much bigger version of what Golden Apple was. But you yeah. would walk in, and they would have models in the back. Hexen, a Hexen, that, a Flaxen. Yes. The comic Flaxen. Well, was. not model like, look at this model in a bathing suit, but like, remember they- No, but they, she worked there, and then that comic became her. Like, someone wrote a comic around her. Was she a model her. maker? No, she was just this gorgeous girl. <laughs> and they built a book around her? they built her? a book around her. Yeah, it was a big thing. I remember that. that Which was, was like, a huge thing. Like, it was a comic book store with their own comic book. Yeah. 
Um, and then before that, it was only like New England Comics yeah, had Tick. The Tick. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're making, you're making me cry. This is like taking a fucking trip through time, dude. <laughs> um, all right. So nobody, they were like Golden Apple. That's your old man's comic book store. Yeah. Or that's the corporate. That's like IBM to your growing Apple. Yeah. May, I, maybe it was like Texas Instruments. To, 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 <laughs> honestly, at that point. But, the, um, you know, we'd go to Heidi Ho. I mean, as a comic fan, you'd go everywhere. Right. You'd go wherever you Heidi had Ho, to. Santa Monica. Yeah. And that to me, like Heidi Ho was the most similar to the store that I had worked at in Massachusetts. It was like the Dalton Golden Silver Age as back well. issues vault. Yeah. You know, you'd walk in and you'd just go through those those back issues. A and, real comic book store. Yeah. What what you'd think of now, uh, if you're our age, what you think of as as a, a real comic book store. And now everything's <laughs> what, toys. What and, kids today would be told is a thrift store or something yeah, exactly. along those lines. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. The God, how many comic book stores you walk into have a back issue selection anymore? Anymore. It's if if they do, they're almost shy about it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's kind of like um there next to the adult books. But there's a few. There's a couple places. There's um great place. I think it's Comics Factory in Pasadena. They've got like a whole back issues room, but it's in the back. It's a separate room, and I think everything there is cover price. They've got like a, a kind of cool deal going on. But you know, I I go whenever I go out of town, and my wife can attest to this that um I automatically search out the little comic book shops. I have oh, to. Oh man, after Mount Heart. You know, even if I'm not buying comics anymore, I just have to know that they're there. And and usually the only I will problem, buy something. the thing I can't do about that though is I, I used to be able to seek it out and then go in and that'd be that. But now it's like if I go in, it's hey, fuck it, it's that guy and yeah. shit. So you have to gauge whether or not you know. All right. Is this going to be worth it? Or, you know, it's probably there's nothing going to be there that I can't find in my own store or online. So that spirit of adventure yeah. has kind of gone by the wayside. But I, do, I, I will still walk into it like a fucking art gallery, mm-hmm. particularly like if it's a comic book store, art gallery and shit, then you, know, you can do other things. Yeah. Um, all right. So wait. So you're working. You start working at, at um, La Luz or you start mm-hmm. working for them. Were you there during the move or no? Uh, yeah, up until the move and actually um, helped dismantle the shop um, when we were getting ready to move out to Silver Lake. And there's a year, or Las Feliz, there's a year that's an overlap where the, um, we're building up the Las Feliz location, mm-hmm. which is in the old Las Feliz um, post office. That's what it is? Yeah. It that's is why it a looks squarish, like fucking ugly as fuck building that yeah. they've made look better with paint. Yeah, but it's got those weird windows and yeah. the red door, so it looks like something from the 70s. It is kind of industrial and yeah. kind of governmental. Yeah, you're right. So the only thing that you might have ever really seen that storefront in is the Runaways movie because it was the only thing that really looked, period. That's it, dude. Yes. Just the, op- just the outdoors and never inside. And we've allowed certain people to shoot the sign, but um, until you guys requested, we never said yes. Because it had to be something that we knew was going to fit. Right, and sweet. we didn't want to break the brand and we like you. and Touched so we, as fuck. And for all we know, pilot didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe everything's kept intact. <laughs> right, right. But um, all right. So um, you st- so did you leave at a certain point? I did. At, um, in 1995, I was, I was working as an assistant manager of the gallery upstairs. And I covered a shift for somebody downstairs in Soap Plant. And Wacka was then down the street and down this funhouse mirror alleyway. And it was mainly postcards and like import toys. And um, so I was covering register and Mel Brooks walked in and whipped the door open and just like pointed at me and said him. And I didn't recognize him. And this lady came in and she was like, are you free in an hour? And I was like, well, I'm I'm working. And um, the manager who who was at this point my roommate walked over and was like, that was Mel Brooks. You got to go. Like you, you have to do this. And I was like, that was Mel Brooks. She's like, yeah. So um, I went down the street and shot this commercial with him for Robin Hood Men in Tights, where he had a bunch of different groups of people. And we were like the rockers right. singing that song as like a weird promo for this terrible the movie. movie. <laughs> you know, arguably the worst Mel Brooks movie. <laughs> And um, I didn't think anything of it. And it was like, oh, well, I guess I've done acting now. You know, I'm, I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> You're like, this happens to everybody who's out here. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I didn't think much of it. And then I went to, I was working nights at at, um, at this nightclub. And um, I'd become friends with um, a girl who came in. And, and her um, her boyfriend at the time was Trent Reznor. And he had just scored Natural Born Killers, which my friend Don Murphy had just produced. And Don used to live upstairs in 
the um, Fantastic Store comic shop. He lived above it? He lived in the shop. Like he was That was he, his apartment? He didn't live any place. Like he was didn't have a place to live and he was living at the comic shop while he was waiting to move from one apartment to another. Wow. And so the friendship between Gaston and Don goes back that far. And I was still around at that point um, earlier when he was doing this. And that's how we found out who Quentin Tarantino was. And that's when Fantastic Store became a shooting location for True Romance. And so I I basically art directed that comic store for that movie. Holy fuck. That's and your work, dude. It was my work. And we thought it was going to be all Batman because it was Warner Brothers. And they're like, no, it's, it's got to be all Spider-Man. So I went in and changed everything to Why? Spider-Man. Why was it because of they what you talked rights, about? They didn't have the rights, I guess. They How weird, rights, yeah. man. But what a good call. You were like, eh, it's Warner Brothers. got to be all Batman. Yeah. Sure. But uh, so we redid it and it was fine. And, you know, years later, here I am working at, at the, the gallery. But um, I ended up going to see Natural Born Killers in the morning of the day that it opened right. with her. And then she had a casting session. So I went with her to her casting right. and I got bored and I signed in and I got this this part. And it was um, a commercial for like GTE and it was shot by Moshe Braca who had shot, you know, like everybody from Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix to the Beastie Boys. And I didn't know what to do because I'm like, oh, I guess, you know, Mel Brooks gave me like 150 bucks cash and patted me in the back. This was like a whole different thing. This is like a contract. And so I ended up getting her agency and I started acting for a while and and I started booking a lot of stuff. I booked like PlayStation commercials and um, I did a couple of McDonald's spots and I I, I did one of the win the Batmobile spots for the um, Batman and Robin movie. The fuck, really? Which is like both a source of, you know, (laughs) joy joy and and shame. (laughs) (laughs) And and it was a pretty lucrative career for a while. I did a cotton commercial for like five years and I was in the Super Bowl like three years in a row. The whole time? And you'd never acted before until Mel Brooks was like, that guy. Yeah. Did you ever encounter him after that? No, no, never. How fucking batshit crazy. Like, you're one of the few people in the world who could be like, maybe you and Cloris Leachman could be like, <laughs> Mel Brooks changed my life. Yeah, yeah. And it wow. was just amazing. And then I, I didn't really love acting. I right. wasn't like a huge fan of it. I loved movies. Right. And I hated going to casting calls because I I don't look like Brad Pitt and I'm not a tall guy. And um, in those days, if you were lucky, you'd be in a room full of people that were like cool to you. Right. And so you'd go on spots sometimes for like Carl's Jr. You look around the room and it'd be Tobey Maguire. It would be, um, the fuck really? Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal, you know, like or a young Jake Gyllenhaal right. and we'd be sitting around and <laughs> not, other actors. not, not Tobey Maguire and Jake Gyllenhaal now kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, Oh shit. Is it that bad? Yeah. It's like, 90, <laughs> he should have stayed on Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. So this is not, this is back in the day. Yeah. Wow. And these guys were cool guys and you talk to them and, and you get used to seeing each other and you'd realize, oh, well, this person's good at this and this person's good at that. And I could book commercials and those guys couldn't. They can mm. book movies. Right. And um, like indie stuff at the time. And I think um, Toby booked Joyride, I think, at that point. And I remember um, Billy, um, golly, the dude from Almost Famous. And I almost got cast in that. And I almost, I, I, I read for... I think five or six callbacks on American History X. Really? Yeah. And I mean, that went on for a long time. And then they, they were building pilots around me and I was doing stuff with trauma. It was like this really weird stuff, but I'm this guy that no one knows, that no one's heard of because none of this stuff reached. You know, it's wild, like man. five pilots that went nowhere. And um, But you could pay for all that shit, right? Um, not at Viacom. Really? If Viacom was non-union, so anything that happened at MTV Networks just went away. Oh, yeah. So you, I wasted like nine months on a Viacom pilot, and after that, I'm like, I'm done acting. And but I did a lot of rewriting in that, so I became kind of like a, a script mechanic for a little bit. And mm-hmm. friends of mine that were writers would be like, I've got too much work, but you know, writers don't want to turn anything down because you just never know if you're never going to work again. True. So I'd have friends that were I felt it was like the front, you know, it's like the So you were ghosting shit. I was ghosting for stuff them? for them, yeah. And um I I do a little What did bit you want to do when you were in high school? <laughs> I wanted to draw comic books really. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it, Look like, how far it took you I so know. far. We're not even to the fucking meat kids. I know, right? What we want to talk about, but keep going. Yeah, so it was all this this kind of traction was happening at the time and it was just I didn't know where it was going to go. And I think if I'd been a little bit more savvy about the way that things work, I might've done things a little bit differently, but I'm kind of happy with 
with everything as it went then. I'm very happy with the way that it's turned out now. You did a bunch of shit you never imagined you were going to do. Yeah. And, and then fucking like, I feel like, like a, that was an adventure. I feel like a, a you know, like the nerd Forrest Gump. You know, <laughs> kind that, of, man. That I just kind of walked into these situations. Like I, I was at the forefront of the goth industrial scene at Helter Skelter and Control Factory in the early 90s. Really? Yeah, that's the nightclub I worked at. And that Club The one Flex, you mentioned before, you're like, I worked at a nightclub. Yeah. And Club Flex, which was the Tuesday Night Rap Reggae Club, is where Eminem took a bus from Detroit to participate in like a rap battle. The fuck, really? Yeah. And we just remember there was a white guy on stage rapping at this at this rap reggae club where you could totally count on one hand. Um, the amount of people that were white people. That were white people in that club and, and four people behind the you bar. You were like, it was me and Eminem. <laughs> yeah. And so we didn't recognize him at all. And, and I don't remember much about it. We just know that that was the place. And you'd see people like Tupac would come in and he'd be at the bar and Biggie Smalls. And, um, you know, I got a great story about smoking pot with the Wu-Tang Clan. Do it. Now that I know I'm not running for office. Um, <laughs> that um, I, they were out back. And um, it was before security got there. So the only person in the club was the club manager's guy, Gary. And I would always get there early to prep the bar because I was a bar back at that club at that particular night. And there's like these dudes and there's like nine guys just kind of sitting out back and they're smoking pot. And I roll up in like this completely beat up, you know, Chevy Citation or something and pull them back. And I ring the doorbell. And you can see like the light on behind like that that peak the peephole that's in the back of those those iron doors in back of clubs. Yeah. You can see like a head kind of like block the light for a second. You can see it go to one side and look, and then go to the other side and look, and then you saw it walk away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was not gonna open the club while there was these dudes in back of <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, Gary, and I'm hitting on the drum. Like, what do you mean, you asshole? Because I didn't want to not get paid for the time that I was there. And every week at the club, I'd wear this vest that had like a bottle opener attached to it and stuff. And at, at a rap reggae club, you wouldn't get good tips. Mm-hmm. But they'd often throw little bags of pot at you. And so I just stuffed them all in this top pocket. And I wasn't smoking pot at the time. And these guys are like, you know, hey, Pecker, are you cool? And I was like, yeah. And I walk over and they're like passing around a joint. And Convincing. Was, yeah. yeah. And I was like, this is terrible. I was like, this is really terrible weed. And they're like looking at me like, what do you know about it, guy? And I was like, try one of these. And I just open up my um, my vest pocket and hand them a couple of these little baggies. And um, I think it was um, ODB. And he pops some of this weed in his pipe and he starts smoking it. And he just like makes his face like... <laughs> Like, motherfucking Pekka, what knows he's talking about? <laughs> like, and then they were just, like, super cool, and they are just nice guys. And I was I was familiar with their music. It was, I think, the first time they came to out to California. Mm. And um, and they played that night, and I just made sure they had, you know, like a case of Heineken and a case of Guinness that they that they could pull up in the um, in the DJ's booth. And they were just super nice guys. And, and that was not always the case in that club, and it was kind of rare, actually, that people really? were really Some cool. Really? Some people yeah. were assholes? A lot of them, yeah. <clears throat> why why do they think that's the better way to go i don't know I, I i think it's a lot of times that you know people that treat you poorly it's not people with power that do that it's people that want to th- want it to seem like they have power and they're just really afraid of what's happening to them and that's generally true i think in life but especially of of people in the music industry and, and even people you know in entertainment that most people are pretty damn cool yeah if some people have a much more common touch or you just have more in common with them mm. and you can meet anybody on a bad day that's true. You fucking, know? God damn it. Look at you. Fucking, what, what a great way to fucking look at it, man. <laughs> no wonder you are the Forrest Gump of fucking. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Shit. All right. So when do you circle back to the gallery? I went from being an actor into into writing and then into producing. And I, What'd you um, produce? I, I bought DVD titles. So I, I, if you, you know, Pinky Violence, you know, like the Japanese movies. Yeah, yeah. That was me. I'm the guy that brought those films to the US. Really? So I ran Panic House. That was my company. And I brought like all the pinky violence. How many movies. fucking lives have you lived, I know, man? It's, it's Jesus weird. Christ! I just, you know, I'd I'd, I'd hit a new thing, and I, I'm I'm one of these guys that I, if I find out about something that I like, I go all the way into it. Yeah, you know, it's like me. I, that's the way. I'm like, oh, I like this. Yeah, I become like you know a reverse engineer of, of yeah. this, and if it's coolness, I'm like, I'm reverse engineering something cool, <laughs> and, and getting really into the nitty gritty of it. And with the with the Japanese films, my friend Christy had a bunch of these videotapes. There was a point in the um, in the 90s, there was a, a, this great video store that was in the back of the black market called the Goblin Market. Where was it? It was on Melrose, like real, like close to Winchell's Donuts, like almost at, um, at La Brea. No, at, yeah, at La Brea. 
And Donnie Gillespie, who was the guy that was behind um, Goblin Market, mm. had like El Topo and Holy Mountain on Laserdisc. I was so like, it's like the Kim's video. Of yeah, like of that area. Of that area. And so I'm like, this guy, this is the shit. Yeah. So, you know, I had to rent this from Scarecrow Video. Jodorowsky can be found here, folks. <laughs> yeah. We found Jodorowsky. <laughs> so I was, you know, making tapes. And, and um, I joked that there's a, um, a Walter Kennedy in the Pirate Hall of Fame. My dad's name was Walter. And um, that I come from a long lineage of pirates and that my <laughs> grandfather was a bootlegger and not, you know, during <laughs> Prohibition. And so this is part of my lineage. And so I was, I was making clandestine videotapes and selling them. <laughs> and then I was like, well, there, if it's a title that everybody wants, there's got to be money in licensing these. Like, maybe I should pay attention to this stuff. And I ended up working for Bill Lustig. Who's that? He's the director of Maniac and Maniac Cop. Mm. He ran Blue Underground. Okay. And so his shop was kind of like the Beatles of the independent home video market. Like everybody that worked for him went off and did great things. And I think I left first to do Panic House. Joyce left to do No Shame Films, and they did these amazing restoration of Italian films. Um, David Gregory left to form Severin, and they do amazing work with Jess Franco Films and all, the, all this stuff. And then you had Norm, who had been a film licensor, who brought in Terry Gilliam. And there was like um, the guys over at Synapse had started as partners of Bills at um, Elite before they split off to become um, Synapse. And so like it just became like this. Like you look at where the band, the band comes from and it's like, oh, it's Deep Purple. You know, it's like right, right. here's the Yardbirds and here's, you know, this so other band. basically like you went from being like a bootlegger to being like – well, how much would it even be if we just licensed it? Right. And it wasn't that much. Well, it was it was high back then, but there was much more prestige in it. And so, like, I wanted to do the right thing. I, I, I put, I learned from Bill Lustig to clean stuff up to be as good as it can look. Right. Which is not a great economic model, but if you pick the right titles, you do okay. And so with, with Sex and Fury and, like, Female Yakuza Tale, um, we, we made money on those. But the Japanese licensing, it took, like, five years of meetings to, um, when I was still at Blue Underground. And I got to the point where I felt like, you know what, this might go someplace and offered the titles to, um, to Bill. And he's like, I don't want to work with the Japanese. It's impossible. You got to, you know, you have to open up all your documents and show them everything. And I don't want to do that. Mm. And um, so I went to Raiko, who was distributing him at the time. And they're like, why don't you set up your own label? And at that point, the Mr. Skin guys had come into town and they wanted to start a DVD label. So I ended up helping them set up their label and I became like the company president and I, bought all the titles and I was sort of like the face of the company. And then we set up a second title called Casa Negra, which was for all Mexican exploitation films and horror films in the fifties. So Holy I cleaned up, Bra I cleaned up Brainiac. Really? I mean, I made that thing look like, you know, an Orson Welles film, <laughs> with the amount of work we put into that and uh, Mysterious the Ultra Tumbo and, you know, uh, Curse of the Crying Woman, all these classic Mexican films. Cause they're beautiful, beautiful Gothic movies. I got an award from um, Edward James Olmos at the um, Los Angeles Latin International Film Festival with the Egyptian and- um, For the restoration? Yeah, for the restoration work. I got the best packaging design for the Pinky Violence Collection, which looks like this this um, you know pink, puffy box. It's so wrong. It looks like it's something <laughs> for like teenage girls. And then I'd go to like <laughs> comic conventions and teenage girls would have made stickers out of pictures from that that thing. I thought, I was like, this is, this is the greatest thing ever. Why, so when did it stop? Why did it stop? Um, the, my investors at Mr. Skin were used to a, a really great business model, which is that you pay nothing for content and then you get people to subscribe. And I had, um, asked when we first started out to have a certain amount of money dedicated to acquisitions before we started. Right. And then when we were up and running that we'd have to, um, release a certain amount of titles. And I kind of agreed to a happy medium. I'm not going to blame them for this because, um, I think we're all kind of learning at the wrong time in the business right around 2007. Um, the business really started to fall apart. Mm. And um, so that all the brick and mortar shops started going away. We had a lot of product. Um, Ryko had a, another company called Legend House that put out a title that had hardcore in it. Mm. And some kid got a hold of it at Best Buy and his mom called up Best Buy and complained and they pulled all of that company stock, everything distributed out of their stores. And then I'll probably have to pay for it at that point either. And, but that meant that if you had 7,000 units in uh -huh. Best Buy, it went back to you immediately. And if you didn't have titles coming out every month, you couldn't cover the losses. So we decided to sell. Right. And I started interviewing with, with companies to buy the company, but I got the same line from everybody. They're like, well, yeah, yeah, Panic House, but you. 
<laughs> you know, do you want to work for us? You know, it's like, well, what do you want me to do? And it's so like, you had a future, even as the thing was closing up, yeah. you're like, oh my God. I'd love to write a book called Failing Upward, but. <laughs> <laughs> I already beat you to this, it, this my is people that I've media. stolen that fucking title. <laughs> um, so who was it? Who snagged you? Where'd I went you to um, the guys that ran IRS Records. And I was like, the, if I can learn from anybody, it's going to be these guys, you know, and, you know, Miles Copeland had been like a huge piece of my music childhood. If it wasn't heavy metal, it was something that came out on IRS for right. a long time. And so that, that was my, my introduction to punk and new wave and everything else. So, um, I, he wasn't really with this company it's called liberation, but the other guy, the other principal was, um, was behind it and they just brought me on board and they, they offered me a, like a, a very much more than fair salary. I would say kind of an insane salary. Mm. And so I left, I was in Chicago for, at the time and I bought a house and then I'm like, Oh my God, now I got to leave. I just sold that house <laughs> like three months ago after all, this <laughs> after all this time. But, um, the, it was an education because I learned that there were people who were just really good at raising money Mm. and not really good at infrastructure. Mm. But that gig put me in touch with a lot of people that are now really, really good friends of mine. Um, and I, I got to release the Gits movie, which is the, um, about uh, a rock band from Seattle with a female um, singer that um, their career tragically ended when the singer was raped and murdered right before their major label um, album the was coming called? out. The Gits. G-I-T-S? Yep, like the Monty Python, you know, the Gits. And it was a murder mystery that got solved after we bought the film. That um, the fuck? that there was an epilogue to this that they caught the guy that killed me as a pata. And so that was the la the one of the early projects, and it became the last project that came out. And as the House of Cards was falling in entertainment, you'd send an email to people at Paramount and get seven hundred bounce backs. Um, that I saw the 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 meetings happen. You know, the doors open and close and. It's like, okay, everybody's getting let go. What am I going to do? Right, right. You know, and then they came into my office and um, I offered them the chance to bring me on as a private contractor rather than as a, um, a, a staffed employee, which would bring their overhead down and they could write me off under each individual title, which goes against the royalty. And But that I had to oversee the release of Gits, that there was opening that Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday in nightclubs. They did a nightclub release for it. So I spent no money on M and A right. and just had money coming in for the rentals. And then the, the DVD dropped that week. So it was like a really fast release. I'm like, if anything goes wrong, they've got nobody to call. Like these filmmakers have my word right? and I need to make sure my vendors were taken care of. Look at you, man. Fucking everyone else cutting and running. And you're like, wait, what about responsibility? It's a relationship business, right? I mean, well, these are your friends. Don't even fucking stand that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah, it's what it should be. And when the company finally, um, started filing and stuff started going away, I called up every licensor that I had landed a project for mm. and told them how they could get their property back for like a dime in the dollar because it was just all, it was all available. What was, so where can people watch The Gits? The Gits is on DVD through Liberation Entertainment. Um, our distributor at that point, I think was Genius. I'm not sure if they're still around. I but, remember um, that company. I don't yeah. think they exist anymore. It was an ironically named business. Yeah, yeah. But, um, they released Clerks too. I do remember that yeah. actually, yes. Um, if I'd known you then, I would have warned you, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, it's, it's out there and I think you can, you can find it streaming. The filmmaker has made it available. It's probably, if it's not on Netflix, it's on one of the services that you can pay for. Uh, and, um, Court of Vision was another one, which is a documentary about the guy that took the, um, the famous iconic photograph of Che Guevara uh, and that filmmaker, um, Hector Cruz Sandoval is one of my absolute best friends. So that, that experience of being at that company, um, landed for me in terms of, you know, human currency, like something I could never pay back. And so I loved, I loved the fact that I had that opportunity, but I went into Warner brothers after that. And I went into, um, into Vivendi for a little bit and started so you worked corporate as well. Yeah. And that was, that was, it hit a point where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Mm. Like, I think I need to do something else for a living. And so I was I'd been in a weekly card game with Billy Shire, who who, who was used the to owner. work for back in the day. Yeah, and he's like, "Well, what do you think about coming back and running the gallery?" And I was like, "Well, what kind of what kind of hours is it? You know, what do you need?" It's like, "Oh, you know, twenty twenty four hours." I was like, "That sounds like something I can do." I didn't 20? realize he meant a day. You know, I thought he meant a week. <laughs> but um, those first couple of years was a lot of kind of getting things into into order, and there was shows that were already booked, so I didn't have much say in, in the first year. And then I was like, just give me two shows a year and I'll be happy. 
And by year three, I think it was the opposite that um, there were a couple of shows that he was insisting upon. I was booking everything else. And so I, I went head back into 2009, 10. Mm. And by 2011, when we did the anniversary show and did the book for that, the 25th anniversary of the gallery at that point. A big show. Yeah. You two, can see pictures of it online. Amazing fucking yeah. pieces. And so. That's a mind blowing show. Yeah. And that was also the same year that I decided to publish the, the pop sequentialism book. Mm. I'm like, I've been collecting comic book art since I was 12. Um, I have, I've amassed a pretty important collection of first appearances of certain characters. For me, it was the collaborations. It's like the writer artist thing mm. was more important to me than having the first appearance of a famous character. Right. And with comic art, there's only one. I'm like, let's do a show about that elevates comic art in the eyes of my fine art collectors. Mm. This is the gallery that showcased Robert Williams. He was in comics. We did the Zap 13 show but there didn't seem to be any anybody working to do that for superhero comics. Right. And so that became like kind of my driving force. And I did something which I recommend nobody do, which is I purchased all the pieces for that show because that's the only way you can do a show like that. Why? Because artists let the stuff go the second it gets published. Oh, that's right. So it's not, you can't go to them and be like, hey, can I borrow that piece? Like, I don't have it. I sold it years ago. And it's a sales gallery. Yeah. So, you know, it's not just a museum where people walk in and they see stuff. I wanted it to be available. And um, I kind of tried to do a little bit of research to see if anybody had done it. And it hadn't been done. No one had done an exhibition of modern comic art that wasn't, that was a survey show that wasn't like just one comic, one issue. And I had, I had to get in contact with everybody to do it, to get permission to reprint. And Really? Yeah. And when, when I started writing, because for comics and for comic art, it's so much different than your standard painting. Like I can put up a website and we can have a grid of three, you know, by however many rows. And it's just got the artist name, the title, the medium, the size, maybe the size and frame mm. and the price. And that's really all you need to tell people. And then above it is a little, a little description, a bio about the artist and um, a little bit of information about the body work. Right. With comics, it's that for everything. It's all that top stuff right. and all that info. So it's like, why is it important that this is a collaboration between you know, Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon? Right. You know, why is this page which has no characters on it, but it just has a sword important? So, well, this is actually the origin of Lucifer. You know, this is a very important page. You know? And as, as you look through the, um, the catalog, I realized at a certain point that I had written a book right. and that, I was not going to just have this be something that was going to sit on a server that I was going to publish it. And I'm like, I could do an 80 page giant. Ah, that's why it looks like that. Yeah. And it, it's, it, I did with a uh, comic book cover stock. I didn't, I didn't do like a book All right. and it looks like an 80 page giant. It's got the, um, you know, the watchman piece as the cover, which is the only color piece that was in the show yeah. because it was the only one that anybody would be able to afford at that point. <laughs> as a, a color separation page. And I felt that that was also a part of the process, but that everything else was the original art. And you, you'd see it age. You'd see like, I started as that focal point, the Watchmen, and I moved forward to like Walking Dead mm. and, and capturing her heroism in comics. So it had to be about the heroism that could fit in your superhero comics, but also some of that Vertigo stuff. Right. And so I'd, I'd kept pieces I'd bought in the early 90s. Gaston and I were buying pieces with um, Glenn Danzig, and we were selling um, comic pages one, one at a time. You would co-own the pages? Yeah. Oh, my God, like when, when Barton Millhouse co-owned the comic book? <laughs> <It's kind laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> Treehouse? Yeah. We bought cover to cover, Lobo's Back, number, number one, I think, and number two, and then we bought cover Bisley? to cover. Bisley? Yeah. We owned every piece, the three of us. And were they all painted, those pieces? No. They were all pencils? Yeah, those are all pencils. What did that cost? Um, who? Let me think. I I think it was twenty four hundred bucks for the whole book. For the whole book. And it took three of you to invest the money. Well, Danzig was wanted the cover, and he didn't really want to have to bother with selling the stuff that he didn't want. Right. So he would get the covers, and Gaston and I would split the pages, and so we would just line up how many splash pages and how many sequence pages, and we just we just split it. And we found people that would buy, want to buy most of it anyways. Mm -hmm. Our biggest clientele were the Holland brothers. Eddie and Ernie Holland, who wrote like every Motown hit with um, Dozier. Really? Their office was right down the street on Highland from Fantastic Store. And they bought, they bought like the only Faust pages that ever hit the market at that point. Really? Yeah. And they bought like the cover of um, Green Lantern number 58, you know, the, the Guy Wait, Gardner cover. Faust, like. Tim Vigil. Tim Vigil's Faust? Yeah. Hold on. I got to unpack this a little bit. Not a lot of artwork ever hit the world? 
Not Why? Then. He Is helped, there a reason? He kept all of it. He just didn't sell it. Yeah. But he did give pages to his anchor. Okay. But then number two, these guys that wrote what Motown hits? Like everything. Wanted fucking Tim Vigil Faust artwork? We brought them from buying sports cards into buying comic book original original art. So they used to come in the store and you're like, you guys don't want this. What you want is this. Well, they asked questions. They saw it. So it was like, I'd be selling them Lou Alcindor cards, you know, and Jackie Robinson baseball cards. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the great three 1979 um, NBA, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. Um, and then there's a, one of them has Dr. J on the third card. So it's like a double rookie card and then a star. And selling them this type of stuff because I knew the, the sports card market. And we had some original comic art pages in there too because – it was LA, you know, and you'd get stuff like people from Image before it was Image when they were still working for Marvel mm. would come in, whether it was Jim Valentino and bringing in his Inhumans pages or, um, or sorry, his um, Guardians of the Galaxy stuff. Holy shit. Or if it was, you know, Lee Field would, would maybe get like a Lee Field page and we had some Jim Lee stuff. And they, they were interested. They were like, they read an article someplace about some page costing a fortune and they became interested. So even if they weren't into the source material, they were like, it's a nice investment. Into the investment potential. They took forever to pay us. And so there was like a year, I think, where they didn't pay us. They owed me like $6,000. My rent was honestly, I think, $263 a month. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood in the 90s. And, um, and I'm like starving, waiting for these guys to pay. And then finally I'm like, gosh, we got to go up. And you, know, you didn't want to you know, kill the goose to lay the golden right. eggs. But if you're not getting the eggs, what good's the goose? So we, we, we walk up the street and we're like, you know, bang on the office door and walk in. It's like, can you please cut us a check? Oh yeah, here you go, man. Is that simple? Is that simple? <laughs> the lesson here, kids, is ask. <laughs> yeah. So I had I had kept certain pages, and one of the the books we had bought cover to cover was Shade, and um, it was the only issue. Peter that, Milligan Shade. Yeah. Really. And it was the one issue that that um, Brendan McCarthy did every page on. Wow. So I held on to the final page, which was this amazing splash. And I thought a, a brilliant surrealist masterpiece. And, um, and I've since become friends with Brendan. And he was the first guest I had on my podcast. Ah, tell me your podcast is. Oh, yeah. My, my podcast is Pod Sequentialism. It's on the Meltdown Comics Network. And tell them what the book is. And the book is Pop Sequentialism. Where can they get it? Um, it should be available through uh, most comic stores, anybody who can order uh, through Last Gas. But you can also buy it at... Um, soapplant.com or you can buy it at laluzdejesus.com I'll spell it because we didn't earlier yeah. L-A-L-U-Z-D-E-J-E-S-U-S dot com the Jesus yep La Luz de Jesus um, alright so you have been buying art forever you you told me tell him the fucking Kirby story which blew my hair fucking back <laughs> yeah. so this when, is adorable he fucking met Jack Kirby not just met him <laughs> but played checkers played checkers him? with him yeah so Glenn had been buying stuff from Jack um Glenn was a huge Kirby fan mm-hmm. Glenn Danzig and, um, and for we were, those that are I mean I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows who Glenn Danzig is but Glenn Danzig I don't know if he records anymore he must right he still does yeah when I was a kid he was fucking you know fucking death metal black metal sat- satanic metal um was he before he was danzig wasn't he in the misfits, the misfits. and sam hain that's it sam hain is yeah. the one i'm thinking of so danzig like has always been into the comic books and shit yep. and a f- he was a fan who put his money where his mouth is and yeah. he published comics before i made like clerks and shit like that he was publishing the verotic verotic yeah and those books were fucked up. They were hardcore. They were so hardcore. Like they were the books that made my friend Walter Flanagan go like, that's wow. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And Walter loved that shit. But I remember like, you know, I, I remember being impressed by it. Like this guy fucking, he likes comics so much. He's going to make them. Yeah. Like that was a cool thing left. You know, I wasn't like, I would never say that I was a fucking Danzig fan. I mean, I, in terms of like, yeah, sometimes I get high and fucking, you know, listen but to on mother. Like, yeah, yeah. mother, but yeah. I do love that fucking song. Yeah. Dude. So, but I mean that in part of his character very much impressed me yeah. so much so that when I was able to do things later in life, I was like, I'm going to do things that I just like. Yeah. And he put his money where his fucking mouth was. was anyway. So he's buying artwork with you. Yeah. And so, um, he, he let us know, you know, where Jack lived and how to get a hold of him. And where was this out here? Yeah. It was, he lived out in thousand Oaks. Okay. And um, Thousand Oaks was a, was three bus rides away from Hollywood. You still don't have a car? I didn't then. <laughs> <laughs> How many years have you been out here and you never have a car? I have a car now, but I mean, then I didn't. This was like, ni- this is 91 or 92. It was early on. And um, Jack had gotten, 
you remember the back of the Eclipse comics was like Marvel celebrating their 25th anniversary. What about Jack? And it was like a picture of Jack and he's got a furrow brow. With his yeah, arms yeah, I the remember. Back cover of every Eclipse comic. And um, so when I came out to LA and he had won the lawsuit that got him at least his artwork back. Okay. They weren't giving him, you know, intellectual property rights and that didn't get settled until about last year with his with his family. And what was the settle? Um, we don't know. It's an undisclosed settlement. Oh, but, okay. um, his but they, name, so Marvel was just like, we're done with this. They settled out of court. And I think it's because Disney owns Marvel and they're like, this is an easy headache to make go away. Let's just throw some money at it. And um, and the people that are running the studio now, they, they seem to really be engaged with it. I'll say that. And I know people have made films and um, they just, they, they can't say enough good things about the people that they work with. Right. But that the, when I saw the Jack Kirby credit on Captain America, Civil War, like I, I, the hair is kind of going up in my arms. Like just that moment of seeing that happen because it hadn't happened right. was a major deal. Right. And um, and so I, I got the address and I called him and he was like, "Yeah, come on down." And so I, I get in the bus. I take my three buses. Wait, so you cold called him? Yeah, I just cold called him and said, "Hi, my name is Matt Kennedy, and um, I love your artwork, and I'd love to buy some artwork from you. I got your number from Glenn Danzig." And he was said. Yeah, come on down. That was it. That was it. And um, so I, um, I, I, I get the address. I take the bus. I go down there. I've, I've got my my wallet and I've got my checkbook. And um, Roz there. Yeah, totally. And she she made she Roz made some, is his wife. Yeah, she made us some tuna fish sandwiches. <laughs> and I, I I have a clear memory of drinking Kool Aid. Really, but I'm I'm not sure if I've somehow filled that in through another weird experience. I right, else. just flavored the story, yeah. colored the story a little but bit. It seems like it was Kool Aid. It might have been iced tea, <laughs> but um, so um, I'm in there, and, and his office was like there was piles mm. of comic book pages, like just piles of stuff, and he had all obviously his? all his stuff. Now he had gotten these back in the lawsuit. Yeah. So this was all had it just been sitting in Marvel all that time. Yeah, there was a storage facility that um, most of the stuff came from, I think. But there was also in the Marvel offices, there were these file cabinets that were just filled with original artwork. And um, th- there's also, he said that they kept a lot of stuff, that there was a lot of stuff that wasn't in there. Um, so it had just come back to him? Yeah. Like that was the thing that he had sued for. He's like, well, if I can't sue for this, I can at least sue for, you know, I can sell these pages and you, you're holding on to it and it's mine. And that was never part of the agreement. And uh, the court found for him and they, they had to send it all back, but it took years for them to actually send everything back. And so he's now in a room. Um, the room was not unlike this room as far as size. And he had his table set up. He was still drawing. And um, I think Art Thibodeau. What was he drawing? He did stuff with Art Thibodeau. He did um, some of these independent kind of superhero comics very much. Um, was he a commission guy? Like, could you hire him to be like, hey, man, can you draw? Like, I'm like, sure. Really? Yeah, I'm sure. And um, you could, you, he was still drawing stuff and he had something on, on the easel at that point and it was a fantasy thing. It, it looked kind of like the Eternals, but it wasn't the Eternals. And um, among these stacks, it's like, okay, Kennedy, what do you like? What do you like? He's like, uh, I, I said, uh, Thor, can't have Thor. Tell you what, how about this beautiful Captain America? And his poles, it was like, I don't know where he, he got it from. And, and it was a different size than everything else. It wasn't like standard comic book size. He pulls out this huge piece of illustration board, and it's the centerfold of Captain America 1976 Marvel Treasury Edition Bicentennial. And it's got Cap, you know, and it's got every character in the Captain America universe on it. It's huge. So a billion-dollar piece. <laughs> These days, who knows what it would be. But um, he's like, I'll tell you what. He's like, let's play a game of checkers. He's like, if you win, it's $300. And if I win, it's $400. For the page? For the page. And I was like, sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> and he the would, story alone. Yeah. And he, he, would, he cheated. Like there was like, <laughs> there'd be like a noise outside. I'd turn my head and his, his hands were on the board. And he's like moving stuff around. I'd just look. And he just, he just like lean arms back, folded arms and lean folded. back. Like, like it's your move, kid. It's your move. And I'm just kind of like, I'm not going to call Jack Kirby on cheating at checkers. <laughs> this, is, this is not my life's work that I want. So he won, and but he still honored, I think, the lower price, if I recall. And, and I wrote he let me write him a check, which I, I was surprised at. And that was you bought one piece, that piece? That, that day I bought that one piece, and um, which I then had to take on the bus and then take all the way back. And so I'm a kid holding this Jack Kirby page, <laughs> this giant Jack Kirby page on the bus back to Hollywood. And, and, and 
I guess I got lucky that it wasn't a totally packed bus and I was sitting in the back just kind of holding this and people would kind of like look at it, but they didn't really say much. And someone came over and sat down. It was like this, this kind of, um, this kind of rough gangbang looking dude and kind of sits down. He's got, you know, his collar buttoned up, but like nothing below the second button's done. Oh, He's got right. the hair and, and the hair net and everything. He's like, is that Captain America Holmes? I was like, yeah. He's like, that's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> It's not. great unifiers, comic books, man. <laughs> There's know? no, it's not a, like, it's not rocket science that comic book movies are making as much money because they draw from a deep pool, goes across all genders, all races. For yeah. some reason, these characters, they've been around longer than some of us, in fact, most of us. And so we came into a world with these characters. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I, it doesn't matter, man. Like, I've met, like, I, every year I go to San Diego, dude, like, there is a crazy passionate contingency that comes up from Mexico, mm-hmm. just Latin fucking comic book fans that are like, and you're like, really captain America? Yeah. Like what would be in it for you? But they're like, who gives a fuck? Like I've read this character my whole fucking life. It and transcends it, race. It could be that it epitomizes the American dream. Somehow. Think so is uh, that maybe. simple. And but I can't see it cause I'm dopey American. And shit? <laughs> it could be, but I think that there's also, you know, there's the Joseph Campbell aspect of it, that it's the hero's journey and that that's what makes comic books great. And you know, it's, it's comics and especially superhero comics are the American mythology, you know, more mm. so than anything. I mean, you can make an argument that football was at a certain point and baseball was, but that the, um, that you're really getting Greek tragedy in a comic book and that since the superhero comic was born in America and, and is still the majority of the monthly comic publishing empire, that that's, that's kind of our mythology. Uniquely ours. That's uniquely ours. ours and true American art form. And it has become, over time, more inclusive. And I think especially with things like the X-Men, more so the Marvel comics definitely than the DC comics um, it, in its day, mm. that you had characters that represented different um, races. Even if they were broad stereotypes, they were at least um, presented as heroic and not necessarily villainous. Right. You know, it's not the Captain America of World War II, which would have, you know, the just the the really insulting, stereotypical, really bad Asian stereotypes and some, you know, while I love Will Eisner, I mean, you can't really get past, you know, his sidekick was practically um a gollywog <laughs> and you know it was like really you look at it now you're like wow it's a tough read yeah it is a tough read <laughs> brilliantly composed but i mean it's it's a product of its era and its time but um you know having that access to him and you know i kind of made it my a point of of my existence to reach out to some of these older people mm. that um that not everybody was aware of because i'm like the time is limited and, and i'm not going to be okay if i don't get to meet this person who else a. E. Van Vogt was like a big hero of mine, Arthur E. Van Vogt. And mm-hmm. he had, um, he's been writing for so long that he wrote a World War II that takes place in space in the 1920s. But he was a huge influence. Holy on, shit. Yeah. Original. Whoa, really? <laughs> so meaning like he wrote about World War II before World War II happened. Yeah. And, and then when World War II happened, he's like, well, mine was way better. Yeah, it took dude, place in space. You guys got into spaceships. <laughs> but um, there are no Martians. But the, um, he was a huge influence on Philip K. Dick, who I was a, a tremendous fan of. And he was at this paperback book show out in Northridge. And I just walked up to him. and I had a stack of original paper books to have him sign. And uh, I just struck up a conversation and I asked him because I was starting to get interested in licensing at this point, if anybody had licensed his work. And he's like, oh, we had a guy that came by the house 10 years ago. I was like, well, let me see if I can place anything and just started a conversation with them. Turned out that they lived not too far from me. They Mm -hmm. lived up like Bronson Canyon and that they had known um, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. Jack Parsons, for those who don't know, is the, he's the rocket scientist Satanist, right? Yes, yes. He was um, a student of Aleister Crowley's. Um, like and, hardcore, yeah. like fucking dark arts. And had the highest clearance in the U.S. government and helped develop the, the missile program. And he blew up in a mysterious explosion in Pasadena um, over an area that is now the, um, the, the 134 freeway, the 210 freeway. And he had um, had a salon in his house for free thinkers, which is probably more like a free love thing. Yeah, it was which had fucked a lot. Yeah, from what I remember, Sex and Rockets is the yeah, book Sex and Rockets is great, and he which attracted Elron Hubbard, who developed um, Scientology while hanging out with while him. hanging out with him. And Arthur had been friends with Jack, and he and his wife had be had become very good friends with Jack's girlfriend, who became Elron Hubbard's wife. And so they were like Scientology members, like three and four. 
Oh my God. They had all this original stuff. They had old e-meters and you know, Marston, the guy who had, um, I think it was the guy who developed Wonder Woman. Yeah. He invented the William, lie detector test. Yes. He, yeah. He wasn't a fucking. No, but he sold that patent to L. Ron Hubbard for the e-meter. The fuck out of here. Really? Yeah. There's a missing piece of comics history. I didn't yeah. know. William Marshall Marston, whatever. Yeah. Whatever yeah. Pronounce his name. The guy who was also way deep in a bondage and fucking and pan sexual relationships yeah. before we had a term for it, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, he, well, I knew that he invented the 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 lie detector lie test. detector, but he sold it. He sold a patent to L. Ron Hubbard for the e meter, but it doesn't work. It's a very similar device, but does it? I mean, does he? I mean. Does the court allow for the polygraph at this point still? I don't no? think so. I don't think then so. Then they damn skippy don't allow for the E meter, right? No, they certainly don't, but that became <laughs> a pivotal thing for his ver his early version of Scientology. Um I've studied up on it. I'm I'm full disclosure, not a Scientologist. I've never been a Scientologist and you know, my thing is live and let live. But um it was just fascinating to me that that this 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 nice old guy um, had had such a really interesting life among such weirdos. Yeah, he's you know? the Forrest Gump of that fucking bunch. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he's sure. such true weirdness. And so I, he gave me um, a book that um, Philip K. Dick had given to him. Mm -hmm. And it was a, um, a book club edition of um, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Says, which I still have in my collection. I'll never never leave me. Philip Dick actually held it. He gave it to this guy. This yeah. guy gave it to you. So he gave it to his the guy that he considered his mentor who gave mm -hmm. it to me. And I have a couple of books like that actually that um have, have found their way to me. Maybe that's that'll be a bizarre, very small collection. But um, you know, that he was another guy that I just, I got into contact with and and started to like talk to. And after he died, um, I got a call asking if um if I knew where to help market some of the stuff in his collection. And someone came in and, and they they handled a lot of it and it was mainly auction items. I mean, it was stuff that if you're of a certain mind, that's like gold. And, um, and so it was, I kind of lost contact, but then it, it just became like, at that point I was working for Billy, Billy Shire and I was at the gallery and it was just contact with this whole other group of kids. And it was like seeing Coop is the guy you were talking about. It did like the devil girls and the Jesus driving the car and everything. No, it's not. Coop is the guy. Is it Coop? Yeah. The Devil Girls and not the Devil Girls. I'm sorry. Yeah, there is a. I'll show you. A oh, Glenn Bar has the Jesus. Glenn Bar, yeah. that's who it is. Yeah. Fucking, that's the Jesus piece. I'm the I'm Jesus of 42nd about. Street is the name of that painting. Yeah, of the of the he gets Jesus, out of a limo. Yeah, I wanted to buy that piece. It was, it was red tagged, and then they did. Uh, you guys did prints or you know yeah. a series of them or whatever and they sold out yeah. too it was a fucking amazing print but i I've know got the, the guy that bought that actually offered up for resale when the when the um the market got tough like back i think in 2010 what was he reselling for he anymore? wanted a fortune for it and we couldn't resell it and i don't know if he actually ever did sell or decided to hang on to it oh i fucking love that piece we have uh we got the fuck girl we had it somewhere yeah. in this house glenn bar did then there was a series yeah and just a fucking girl topless girl fuck look like a metal chick not a metal chick like a punk chick and then the other piece is, is still up on the bar upstairs it's the devil head sculpture not devil girls like the coop does but um it's just, it was a he did a sculpture yeah. like and just a pretty girl face but little horns yeah and, and he did one i think was an angel if i remember correctly but yeah. the wife gravitated toward the fucking devil one go figure mm -hmm. but oh glenn Barr, that's a dude's something else you have in common with other comic book fan james gunn because um there was a piece that i thought was perfect for his place right and james i'm like gunn for the come on i don't have to explain who james <laughs> gunn is if you don't guardians know of the galaxy, come yeah. on kids guardians of the galaxy director Amongst many other cool Super things. great film. Yeah, yeah. And um And that Slither. I love Slither's Slither great. a fun movie. Man. Yeah. And he goes what I dug about Gunn is he goes deep cuts. He goes back to trauma. Yeah, which is where I first came into contact the with. The fuck? Him. You knew him when he was a trauma too? I so you handle, knew Lloyd and I handled Fuck the marketing else? for that movie for Tromeo and Juliet. Really? Yeah, I did all the guerrilla marketing for that in LA. I got that I got trauma films from being Films that were only midnight movies back into their only day bookings that they had had since class in Newcomb High. The fuck? Because I worked at the nightclub. Yeah. I grabbed those terrible, stinky um, air fresheners yeah. and the posters and postered every single club every night of the week for three weeks in the in the LA club show circuit. And people just 
turned out for the movie. The fuck, really? Yeah. So for Lloyd, he was like, ah, I love that Kennedy kid, you know, and I was working with David Schultz. And so James came out at a certain point and he, he wrote the Lloyd Kaufman book. Mm. Um, and I met him a couple of times, but reconnected with him when a friend of mine started dating him a few years ago. And it was like, oh yeah, I was like, you know, I was, I was the guy that, that kind of launched that movie. That's fucking nuts, yeah. dude. He don't get to fucking Guardians of the Galaxy without trauma. Without trauma, man. yeah. Wow, that's yeah. fucking nuts. But he's an amazing writer too. And Gunn is? Yeah. Didn't he work on, did he write Scooby-Doo? Is that what? Yeah, but it, his um, Dawn of the Dead script is the one that Snyder made? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great script. That's an amazing, I mean, people. I love that movie. Hollywood, Hollywood Book and Poster, which is a place I did a little time in too. You work there? Yeah. God, I used to love going to that place. Yeah. I like, like, I like, that was, you know, some people like, oh, I love going to a porn store. I used to love going to Hollywood Book and Poster, dude. Yeah. They have Eric Reed in his magazine. Yes. Walk in, Ignoring in his hands. Yes. Oh and my shame, god! You know, Eric, Eric. And you never that was a place too that I never felt relevant. Like I would go in the beginning of my career, I would go in, and if my movie poster for whatever movie, like I remember going in looking to see if there was a Mallrats poster hanging up. There was a Mallrats poster on the wall in there. Yeah, it was in the window point, display. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. later on, like you know, fucking like when other people liked it. But I mean, day and day, because I would mm-hmm. go in, and you know, whatever movie was. Whatever poster just hit the fucking glasses in the theater six months before, yeah. You he would they yeah. would have it hanging up. So m- when Mallrats was like the weekend it was coming out, we did junk it out here. So in ninety five, I remember going to Hollywood movie book and poster, and fingers crossed, walking in, and go please let it be hanging up because that means we're relevant. And it was hanging up. Yeah. There's one of them, but I was like, good enough. Yeah. Um. It was that I, that oh God. That place was such a fucking hallmark, and I went to it. I guess like two years ago or something like that. I walked in because I was like, I want to buy a poster. Like it was a real juvenile kind of like, I'm not going to live unless I own that Batman Returns poster of Michael Keaton. And yeah. I walked in and, you know, I was like, you know what? I don't need to own this. But it was so awesome to be back in the space. Yeah. It was like a quarter the size at that point. Yeah, it's yeah. not what it – it's a shadow of its former self. Yeah. But, I mean, whatever. It's, you know, everybody's fucking – retail world particularly down there and that kind of space is tough and stuff but they're still fucking making a go of it too that's the crazy they closed thing. the closest store last year for a while you know it's done and then eric died it's that's all then but um i was just sitting there going you know i was just literally about to be like i would love to go fucking pop in john's over at larry edmonds now what's that which is the bookstore that's on the same block so um that that long block that hollywood book and poster was on like yeah. whitley and cherokee if you go a little bit further west is larry edmonds hollywood um bookshop so it's kind of like they're very like-minded we always got along with them if we didn't have it we'd send people down there I'll tell you something right now matt if you hadn't moved out to hollywood with your lifelong best friend who abandoned you <laughs> and had grown up in new jersey we would have been lifelong best yeah. friends we like all the fucking same shit yeah. man i'd have been rubbing an egg on my nipples <laughs> <laughs> um all right so all of this is a very long way of getting to tell you the story which is um, a mystery yeah of dc comics mystery yes a detective comics mystery if you will oddly enough yes um matt told me this and i fucking uh, i believe the yiddish people say plotst uh, absolutely plots it, it was it's a it's a brain burner and like you rarely hear shit like this anymore like oh my controversial like everything the rights to everything have been long bought and paid for and set to fucking rest. So much so that, yeah, even Marvel's like, give the Kirby family whatever yeah. they want, man. We're, we're printing money over here and stuff. So very rarely do you hear a story like this. Tell them the fucking story. Okay, so while I was putting together the Pop Sequentialism catalog, mm. I started just combing through almost every online site that carried original comic book pages. And I'd known that while the focus of that first show was going to be the last 25 years of comics at that point, the dark mm. ages, um, that I would eventually do a show that was going to be classic stuff. And I also, it re-energized my interest in comics and especially the stuff that I had been very into when I was younger. So you got a life at a certain point. Like, it's not yeah. like comics are no life, but it's like, there's a time in our lives. I, dude, I read everything. Yeah. And then there's a time in your life, and I hate to talk about it, but it's true, where your pile of to be read 
slowly climbs to the point where it's as tall as your desk. And then there's a pile right next to it. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I've seen it happen with my email. It's 3,000 emails in my inbox. I'm like, I'll get to them one day. That's <laughs> never going to happen. I'm going to die. They're going to be in that box. So you fall, you know, it, it's only because you're busy doing other things. Mm-hmm. And it's not because you don't love it anymore and stuff. But, like, this was a kid who fucking, like, would have liked to have done some of these things. One thing. You wanted to work in fucking comics. Yeah. Wound up going on the adventure of a lifetime, as you <laughs> heard. So, you know, it's okay to fall. Every once in a while, people are like, you fucking do a show called Fat Man Batman. You only read comics currently. I know there will be a time in my life when I go back and I read more and more. Yeah. And it's not to say that I don't read comics. I just don't read anything new. Mm. Just like I don't listen to new music, to be honest with you. Yeah. Not that much, unless my kid forces it down my throat and stuff. I find the shit, like just like everybody else in life, I find the shit I like, I stick with it. Works yeah. for me and stuff. So... I'm content not buying fucking brand new Batman comics, but I can whip open the fucking Dark Knight Returns and go take a trip with my friends anytime I want. Yeah. Same way you would watch a movie or fucking read your favorite book or listen to a song or something like that. But there comes times in life where life comes first and you don't get to indulge as much. Doesn't mean you lose your passion. It just means you don't get to read comics as much. But I've had that feeling yeah. and that moment you're talking about where it's like, you know, I got busy doing other shit and all of a sudden I picked this up and I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, this is part of my DNA. This is how I got to where I was. And then you fall back in love and then you get back into it again and stuff. Yeah. It's part of the process yeah. for an older uh, fan. Something you don't, you know, kids don't understand. But like, you're talking lifetimes now. How long you love this shit? Since yeah. you were born? What was the first geek thing you remember? Oh, my gosh. You know, I think that the first geek thing I remember, I. It, cartoons on saturday mornings mm. and you know scooby-doo lunch boxes mm. and kiss cards and mm. you know all that stuff you can i make, mean you can make me fucking come with <laughs> oh god like you just you've all the all of those things von craig evoke a happy childhood yeah man. it's just like oh my god that's right that's Show right. Them warriors that's and micronauts right. you know and why godzilla would, with a fucking leather the firing, tongue and the, the firing, firing fist, fist which yeah. made no sense because yeah. it's like why would his fist pump off <laughs> did crazy. You, i even went as far i got the rodan did you get the rodan that was like that was i mean they, it wasn't called this back then but that was what you would call a one per case yeah you couldn't find that in every fucking store yeah because no one wanted it <laughs> it, it really didn't do much it had these little holes in its back and you would shake its back and then its and big the vinyl wings would, would like pop. That. and this was years after the relevance of shogun warriors had gone away but um you know it, it's it's like you say you know it, it you come back to it and as i was putting this book together mm. i just started really falling in love with these pages that I was like, well, you know, I'm going to sell a few of these pages that are in the, I have to sell it if it's for sale. Mm. Um, I'm not going to lock on to these. I'm, I'll put a certain amount of money into this. And when these sell, this are the ethos of the gallery. It's a sales gallery. Yeah. It's yeah. not just like, fucking look at that shit. It's like, you can buy this shit. But I also violate, you know, the, the, the cardinal rule of the street, which is that I get high off my own supply. You, know, <laughs> you buy a lot. I buy a lot. So it's, you know, the comment. What I, does your fucking place look like? It's smaller than this. You but, got a lot um, of art? I do have a lot of art. Mm, yeah. Man. My wife is nodding her head. <laughs> He's like, like, he sure does. Way too much stuff. But the, um, you know, I would go through these, these surges of selling comic book collections and buying them back. And I realized that, you know, that especially as the omnibus has come out, that it's, it's better paper than it was printed on originally. And I'd rather just have that, that I can pull off the shelf and not have to dig through boxes. Mm. Um, there's a whole, you can make a theme of whether or not that's a good thing to do. But the, um, with the comic art, I started going through these these websites and finding stuff. There was a website out there. I mean, and people know kind of the major comic book dealers. They have good presences. And if you go to like comic books resources, there'll be like a link to uh, comic art fans or Albert Moy. Albert Moy. You know, and some of these guys that sell like really high end stuff. That's a name that like that goes back to my pre work only collecting days. <laughs> You go to the Albert Moy table and fucking table. It was like a fucking boutique. Yeah. And the pieces were high fucking end. But I bought some Albert Moy pieces from the lower end. Some, what do they call it? Not, I mean, so I bought some pencil pages and ink pages, but what are the tr- the transfer pages or the like layer pages where, you know, they when they used to put together the book, it was a fucking four page process or oh, something. Oh, yeah, the process. production color separation sheet. Yes, yeah. bitch. Like I could afford yeah. that. That was in his like five buck or less bucket on the floor. There's like Comic-Con, like right before Clerks came out, Mm. and I'm not sure if you'd been out to San Diego before Mm -hmm. that, 
But like 90, 95 was my first one. Oh, that was a good show though. In 94, 95, so the Preacher book is coming out and I bought seven pages from Preacher number one because no one had read it yet. I bought, I had Preacher pages too, cheap back yeah. in the day. 50. 60, 50 bucks. Yes, yeah, so I paid those prices, yeah. son. I love that book and it wasn't fucking huge yet. No. I mean, it was a book that everybody talked about in the world, circles I travel, but it wasn't like it, a top 10 book or 2010, something. 2010, I flipped those $60 pages for $2,000 each oh to God. a guy who flipped them for four an hour later. <sighs> Why does that make you feel? You're like a piece of shit. I don't mind, but what bugs me is that my friend Felix bought the pages from him, and I'd rather just sold them to him for $2,000. All right. You're like, to the guy you had who made to go money through that. Fu- yeah, you fucking yeah. He juiced it up, you idiot. Yeah, I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I cost you money. Not that I, not that I hurt myself, I just right. cost you money. But the um and Sandman stuff that you could get for sixty bucks from like the Sean McManus run that became two thousand dollar pages. Oh my god! But you know all that stuff. You I still have. I mean, I'm sitting here going like, I go look at my pages. I'll, I'll praise him for you. <laughs> but I I find this guy. You know a, what I a, have, dude? Peace. And I got a, it's back in Jersey, and I got it like it's she went back and forth across the country. You remember uh, Mage? Yeah. He had that beautiful painted cover for one of the hardcover editions yeah i got that piece matt wagner fucking mage. how have you not directed a mage movie by the way dude i almost we came not directed but we came close like me and moj worked with matt and then the other two producer guys try to get a mage movie going (sighs) at um miramax a long time ago i mean there were a couple times we got close like they were like we kind of like it blah 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 and you know they shy away from like at at that time they were shying away from its comic book like but the story was strong enough to be like, you know, oh, it's Arthurian, blah, blah, blah. So we would, we, it, it, I wouldn't say it got close, but like, that's the closest, like, I've seen it come. And then Gilliam does Fisher King, which kind of, yeah, it was bit, different enough. Yeah. But yeah, I remember it was kind of like a, wow, this, uh, this is like, this is like somebody, you know, doing a cover version of a song. It's like doing, um, you know, walking in your footsteps by the police and mm-hmm. changing it to walking in their footsteps, yeah. you know, and maybe changing a note. It's the like, Nilsen without you. <laughs> That's pretty good, Paul. But, um, all right. So wait, so, so to go back, um, you're looking at artwork, mm-hmm. um, Albert Moyes of this world and whatnot. So I find this guy who's got a page that was clearly set up in 1995 and never up, updated. A website page. Yeah. It, it's, and it what year is this that you find it? This is 2011. Okay. And so I'm looking through this guy's site, and at the time, I, I just looked, and it was a very frustrating site. It was set up like an Excel document. I think I've been to this site. You have, and you spent two minutes on it. And, and like, jumped off. This. Yeah, I think so. so. The, um, he would have something listed. He'd have like the title alphabetically. Mm. You couldn't rearrange it, so you'd have to go alphabetically by title. And um, then you'd look over and it would be like artist name and then it would be like, you know, the page. So it was a really weird way of arranging it. And then very, you'd have to like then shift over to the right. You know, you'd have to like scroll to the right to get the entire it's tough to navigate. thing in. And then you, it'd be a price or, it, or the worst, which was the most common thing, NFS. Which was? Not for sale. <coughs> So he's just listing the pieces he had. Yeah, like, like rubbing your nose in it. And then, then you could click on them and look at what you could not have. And it was the most frustrating thing in the world. And when I was when I was buying stuff for the Pop Sequentialism show, um, I spent probably an hour and like ended up like beating my fists into you know whatever desk I was on and just leaving the room. I'm never going back. Fuck there. you. Upgrade. But I was Squarespace.com, <laughs> you piece of shit. I know. And so I finally, as as the months roll on, and um, I had like a weekend where I had nothing to do, and I was under the weather, and I think my girlfriend at the time was out of town. I'm like, I'm gonna check every single listing on this dick site, you know, and I'm gonna go through and <laughs> figure out what's there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll to the right, and I'm gonna look at price first. I don't care how much it hurts, how long, yeah, it takes. how long it takes. And I'm gonna go to the price, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna work this backwards like I would do anything else I do. And so I then it became easier because so much stuff that's not for sale I didn't even want to see it. So I go down and then I look, oh, it's like Adam Page who gives a shit, you know, and then scroll down, it's like um, you know, like um you name terrible artist, terrible title. And 
as I start going all the way through, and this is probably like five or six hours into the search. I mean, this is this is really epic. This because is, he's got he's got it all. He's yeah. he, he, but the dude's like, I did this once. I'm never gonna yeah, do it again. <laughs> I'm done. I'll do it again. But he would update it if stuff sold. I found out later. <clears throat> but um, I finally get down to unknown. And there was a couple of pages, and I'd <laughs> open them up, and then you'd open it up, and the page would be the page, but also have other stuff like written <clears throat> on it, and. It was clearly not unknown. He had he had accredited to George Rousseau. Now, who's that? George Rousseau was the anchor for Jerry Robinson when Jerry Robinson was working on Batman um, with Bill Finger for Bob Kane. For the uninitiated, yes. Tell them who Jerry who that is. Too. Jerry Robinson is the artist credited by everybody, including Bob Kane, for co-creating Robin. He also co-created a lot of other stuff, and um, it took. Um, Bob Kane years to even credit writer Bill Finger for for co creating Batman and the Joker and things like that. So wait, let's let's throw the names out for a glossary for those who are like, what? Bob Kane, long considered father of Batman, yep. now thanks to the sleuthing of the internet, <laughs> yeah. um, reduced to co creator of Batman, yes. Bill Finger, but copyright holder of Batman. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Finger now acknowledged as. Hey man, like not just like he came up with a lot of cool ideas. Like you don't get to Batman without Bill, F- Bill Finger. We've talked about this on yeah. the show. Um, then you get into the Jerry Robinsons and the Dick Sprangs. What did Dick Sprang create? Dick Sprang comes a lot later um, than Jerry and George. And a lot of the, um, he changed the look um, of most of the characters into what a lot of people consider to be like the classic Batman and Robin style. Right. Um, not as rough as the, um, the Bob, Bob Kane Kane's era stuff. and not as, um, I guess more like you might think of it as like a Joe Kubert type look to Batman that Jerry Robinson had. Mm-hmm. And he precedes Joe Kubert by quite a bit, but um, Dick stuff was very pop. And Jerry is the guy that was the laborer on the title. What the guy who that? actually drew everything after a certain point. Um, he was hired by Bob Kane when he developed Batman to ink his pages and to correct stuff. So oftentimes Jerry Robinson would be whiting out and not with whiteout because it didn't exist. Yeah, I was going to say, what did they use back then? <laughs> like painting over it. With and, paint. Yeah, and then inking over and like redoing complete pages. Now, um, so the good news is that since, um, and George Rousseau has, has mentioned in um, in different interviews that exist that you can find, that um that when he when he would get pages from Jerry that and they had come from Bob that there was a lot of white on the page that he had just like gone crazy with the white and redrawn almost everything because right. he was a perfectionist. But um and Jerry is actually incidentally one of the guys that got Bill Finger the credit. Like he fought tirelessly to get Bill Finger the credit for for Batman. Really? And I uh, just a really nice guy. But um so I'm I'm looking through and I see this this listing for this page. And I look at it and it's a preliminary page. It's not a published page. That's interesting. Now, um, my favorite comic book character is Robin. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Why? Tell. My reasoning is that I could be Robin, that I wasn't born a billionaire, right. but a billionaire could adopt me if my parents died. Right. You know, I'm not from space. I'm not from Krypton. You're I like, wasn't born a mutant. There's one road in for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not <laughs> as smart as Reed Richards or Tony Stark. Right. You know, that that the only way I'm making this is if my parents are acrobats and die, that maybe Bruce Wayne will adopt me and make me his ward, and, and hopefully that won't be a weird situation. Your parents are like, I'm sure in there there's love for us, but yes. we understand we have to die in order for his dream to come true. <laughs> yes. So I felt, and, and I also felt that as I as I got older, that's a metaphor for all boys, explain that all boys live in the shadow of their father and so um as you become familiar with the robin character and especially uh, dick grayson that dick grayson spends most of his life trying to step out of the shadow of batman to become his own man and i Mm. think that's what every boy does um who grows up in a household with a dad beautiful so that 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 metaphor works for me and um so there was robin on these pages and it's from the guy who created robin i'm like well, geez, you know, I got a little bit, a little, little jingle jangle, you know, change in my pocket from the show. I'm flush. Yeah. <laughs> Why not me? Why not? So I'm like, oh, the, and, the, and they were super cheap. Like one of the pages was seven hundred dollars, and it had, um, it said it had drawings in the back. And now, it, mind you, seven hundred bucks for an unpublished page. Yeah. So, but still, from the 1930s dr- or 40s, drawn in the 1930s by a legend. Yes. 
And so, and, and becoming familiar with the pricing on this stuff, it was very, very cheap. The other page is $300. What would a like finished Jerry, Jerry page be? A published Jerry Robinson yeah. page from Batman from 1940? Yeah. $40,000 maybe. Jesus Christ. I mean, if it's signed by Kane and, and if you, if you got the signatures on it, it would be crazy expensive. And if it's, you know, pivotal, but I mean, I don't think you can find anything really from the 1940s for less than $20,000. So this is something like, and then even when you bought it, what year is this? This is 2011. All right, so not that long ago. I'm thinking it's a clerical error, you know, and I'm like, and who knows? This site was looks like it was created in 1995. Are these still available? <laughs> right. or did he ever update the price? If I do get in charge of this guy, in, in, in contact with this guy and he does contact me back, right. is he going to be like, are you crazy? That price is from whenever. <laughs> yeah, I so, built this site fucking, you know, <laughs> uh Geo cities back in the day. Yeah. So the um, and I think it is actually Geo City site. <laughs> and, and so I'm I I'm like, well, okay, well, these these are great prices. Let let me open these up and look at them. So I open them up, and they're they've, they're inked, and there's this pencil, and there's some blank um, panels. The classic um, panel setup for pages from the 1930s and 40s are usually um, six to nine panels, mm-hmm. so three rows, mm-hmm. and um, either a series of two panels per row or a series of three panels per row. And these are those. And then I'm, I look at this, this, he's got an image of the backside of one of these pages because he's, he's presenting it as being a double-sided page and it's priced as though it were two of these $350 pages or whatever. Right. And I look at it and I, I expand it and I start really looking at it to see if I can read it. And now the front page is clearly the death of Robin's parents, the acrobats dying, falling off. And then, um, you know, Robin being walked into Batman's house by Alfred or a butler. Right. And um, I turn, I look at the back side of the page and it's got too much on the bottom. So it's, it's clearly was never intended to be published. And this guy says to a clown, hey, boss, Batman's hanging around out here. And it's very much a clown. It's not, you know, necessarily the, um, the image of the Joker that we're familiar with, but it's right. a clown. And, I've seen it. It's a clown. Yeah. And it, it's got some other dialogue written here and there. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I don't remember there being a clown in the origin of Robin. Right. And I do remember that there were, for many years, <coughs> that um, Jerry Robinson was also the creator of the Joker and that Bob Kane fought him on the credit and begrudgingly. Who- so who did is Bob Kane considered the creator of the Joker? Bob Kane had to roll over and admit that Bill Finger co-created the Joker. And he did so in the 1990s, which was about 20 years after Bill Finger had died. So for for years he was like I created the Joker the it's same way me. that he was like I created Batman. Yeah. yeah. And then in the 90s long after Finger passed, he was like, "Yeah, Bill helped on the Joker." Yeah. Now but who so who drew Jerry Robinson. But who drew the original Joker? Jerry Robinson. Nobody contests that. Okay. So I'm thinking, what do I have here? Like, here's a drawing by the guy who created Robin of a Robin origin that imp- that a clown is implicated in. Mm. And this is a guy that also claims that he was part of the team that created the Joker. And I start thinking about the lineages and I start like, thinking, well, holy shit, this page is only $700, number one. Yeah. And so- Get it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, fingers bouncing on the table. What do I do? What do I do? I was like, I have to buy these. I'm going to buy these. And he had three pages that were um, from the same set of preliminary Batman pages. And um, it appeared, he, I think he might even had it listed that he thought that they were from Batman 10. He was wrong. I checked. And um, it was Batman 11 is the retelling of the Robin origin. And it has some of the same exact panels in it, but in a different context. Right. So I, I leave one page because I didn't. I was like, well, if he thinks I'm going to buy them all, maybe he won't let me buy them all. And so I, I um, and then I start going back to the site. Okay, what's available? What's cheap? I need to add some some meat to this so that it doesn't look like I'm only after these Batman <laughs> preliminary pages. So I buy You're this. You're a pro, dude. <laughs> so, Walt would be proud. He would be. Holy <laughs> so, fuck. That's as good as buying figures and returning other figures at Suncoast. Yeah. <laughs> putting the, the saran wrap around the album, putting it in the oven. Yes. But the um, 
the I found a romance page that was attributed to um, Vince Coletta, which was clearly not a Vince Coletta page. And having seen Jack's artwork, I knew it was a Jack Kirby page that maybe Vince inked. And I, it's beautiful, and I, I brought it with me too today. That um, it you can see where Dave Stevens' art style developed. Like, really? Yeah, the headlights, you know, the the um, the boobs and the girl in the image is clearly of the Dave Stevens, you know, 1980s rocketeer type thing. Everything go, you can you can just see it all on this one uh, modern romance page that that Kirby drew. So I, I put that in the list, and I put a couple of dailies for um, for tearing the pirates. Mm. And um, and one other thing, I think it was a daily for a Charles Schultz Peanuts daily, which turned out to not be available. But so how much was he asking for that though at that time? It was four hundred dollars. Really? Yeah. What would a Charles Schultz daily go for today? Um, after Charles died, they doubled and tripled in value, but um, they they still not too crazy because there's, there's hundreds of thousands of them. Oh my God! You guess you're right. Yeah. But there's only one of each, right? Yeah. Did he? Was he his own artist? Charles, as far as I know, Charles all the way to himself. the end. Yeah, he didn't have a ghost or anything. He might have had somebody helping him out towards the end, but um, it's it's pretty much Charles Schultz, and he doesn't seem like a guy that would have left somebody's name off. Like, you know, you see the Flash Gordon serials, and you know, Al Al Williamson got his name on those. It didn't uh-huh. just say, you know, Alex Raymond or something. It, it would have the names of the guys. And and Dave was was ghosting under Al Williamson. Who was? Dave Stevens was ghosting under Al Williamson. Yeah, doing some of the Flash Gordon stuff and, and in in the comic strips, the dailies. Yeah, the really, strips. before he was Dave Stevens or yeah. while he was Dave Stevens. Yeah, before he was Rocketeer Dave Stevens. Jesus. Yeah, but um, there's a lot of a lot of the guys made their living in the syndicated strips for a bit. And certainly- I have a piece of Dave Stevens, a tiny, tiny piece of Dave Stevens artwork on the wall out there. My eyes just bugged. When my, I mean, don't go too far. It's so fucking, it's not, it's original, but it's not published. When my kid was born, um, Joe Casada uh, and, and uh, um, got Bob Chapman at Graffiti mm-hmm. put together this jam piece to be like, hey, it's a girl. And that's what it says. It's a girl. And it's Madman, mm-hmm. Madman, um, Daredevil, who I worked on with Casada. Mm-hmm. And and I want to say Mage or something like that. I forget who the other one is. I had a Mage graffiti design shirt with the lightning bolt. Oh, I fucking lived in that shirt. But they're holding a baby, and the baby was drawn and painted by Dave Stevens. Wow. When you leave, you'll be able to see it. That's amazing. It's fucking nuts, man. Like, it's an incredible jam piece. And from what I understand, not like, it's the last thing you painted, but... It, he was not around much longer after yeah. that. He passed away, unfortunately. He's a, he's a really sweet guy. Was he? Never mind. Fuck, I love the Rocketeer, dude. Yeah. Like, you want to talk about capturing imagination. Yeah. And it was beautiful. Like, just beautiful to look at. And yeah. in terms of the comic book movies, pretty fucking true to the book. Yeah. Like, you know. When, the only thing time everybody when, got mad about is that they didn't call her Betty. Yeah. Well, that, well, because the Betty, they were having a hard time with the um, contact the Betty, Betty page, page thing and Irving claw. And also remember the rocket pack was completely different. Yeah. It was a dual engine as opposed to the single engine. Yeah. God, I love the fucking rocketeer. The one of great, I had that statue. Oh, fucking amazing. Um, all right. So you got, you, you order the pages. They didn't have the Schultz. You're sitting there trembling. Well, I get going, a contact back from him. I get an email back and he's like, um, well, uh, the site still works. <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't take credit cards clearly, and oh um, he was only taking like checks or money orders. And because of the amount of fraud in checks and money orders, um, he needed to qualify my, qualify me. He was like, "You need references. You need to supply some references." And I'm like, "Ah, oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I buy from everybody. You know, like who do you know? Um, I, I named off Felix. You know, I named off." Um, you know, the, the claw, you know, the guy used to sell movie posters in New mm-hmm. York, like all these people that I was buying for mailers. Like, oh yeah, I know Felix. And, um, he's like, okay, so you, you can, you can pay with a check. And I was like, can I send you a company check? You know, I work at a gallery. He's like, yeah, it's no problem. You just got to wait for it to clear. It's like, that's not a problem. So I next day air out the check and I actually <laughs> full disclosure. I also asked for a discount. <laughs> you son of a bitch. And he gave it to me. <laughs> and uh, he told me that the Schultz page wasn't available. And so uh, we, we settled the amount and I sent him a check. And um, I'm, I'm like waiting in hives for like the next week to see if I get this thing in the right. mail. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, what, what if you realize what he has and he changes his mind? You know, um, you know any, anything can happen. And so a week later, I get this package back at the gallery and I open it up and... 
you know, it's like a kid opening up a present, you know, and I, I opened the, um, the Masonite cause it's, everything ships in these, these pieces of Masonite that are taped together. And I mm. very carefully cut the Masonite open and, and, you know, I pop it open and the very top piece is not a piece that I ordered. So right away, you're like, fuck. Like, oh, no. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm like, what if, what if? Then I pull everything out. It was the only thing that was wrong. It was not the wrong, it wasn't like the wrong piece of something I ordered. He accidentally packed another piece. Uh. So I, I I take everything out. I put that aside. The, the um, tearing the Pirates pieces are fine. Modern Romance piece is fine. And then there's those Batman pages. And I was just like, giddy, you know, like giggling like a you maniac. You only see it on the computer yeah. from a fucking 1995 scan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which like one, one line at a time opens, you know. <laughs> you can hear the modem working on the other end. But the um, when I when I looked at them, I'm like, this is even kind of more of a, of a fantastic thing. Like, and, and I've sent some images that you guys can run. The, um, that looking at this page... I, a couple of things kind of immediately leapt into my head. Now I, I know about comic art and I know how to spot a real page from a fake page. Okay. And I know the errors that things were created by just experience of being around certain grades of paper. Um, when pencils have been added, when ink has been added and, um, and the nature of how things are set up and how that can age things. I've seen people try and pass off like Captain America pages from the 1960s as authentic. And I'm like, where's the glue for the lettering? You know, like how come this isn't messy? You know, I've seen the way Jack handled stuff. I know how they handled stuff at Marvel. This would be a complete and total mess. Right. And this looks too too good to be true. It's too good to be true. And it's like, oh, and this is the wrong type of ink. But um, <laughs> with, um, with this stuff, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, these are preliminary pages. Why were they inked? I hadn't even thought about that before. If it's a preliminary page, mm. and th- these were like guys that were working all the time on multiple titles generally mm. and producing a lot of work. And they didn't take a lot of time. The reason why Jack Kirby wouldn't let Vince Coletta ink him is because he erased a ton of his line work because Vince was inking like 13 books a month. Oh, so he was just like doing Detail out the window. Yeah, God. And then he'd get a hold of somebody like Gene Cohn. He's like, I can't ink this. I don't know what to erase. So um, they would actually publish like pencil pages sometimes for for Gene Cohn. They just contrast it, which is what everybody does now. But um, I'm looking at these and I'm like, why are they inked? Why is there ink on this? Some of it's stone pencil. Some of this is inked. Why was it inked? It's clearly inked in the same era as, as when it was created. I start looking into the, um, you know, I find out with a little bit of research that it's Batman 11, not 10, that had the retelling of the, the, um, the Robin origin. And then I start digging into Jerry's life. And I found out, you know, that, um, that Jerry's family were all card players. His dad was actually owned the very first movie theater in Trenton. Really? Yeah. His dad was a Russian. Jerry guy. Robinson's dad mm-hmm. owned the first movie theater in Trenton, New Jersey. Yes. It's, what a weird fucking like. I I could win Trivial Pursuit knowing that. Yeah, yeah. So he's the youngest of. Um, Is he first generation American? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, youngest of five kids. Um, has an older sister, three older brothers. Um. His mom was a, a, a local bridge champ. His um, one Which of his requires brothers, cards to play. Yeah, one of his brothers is um, also a a tournament champion at bridge and other card games. So they all grew up playing cards. So I start reading up on on the story, and I start first online, and then kind of digging through back issues and stuff. When I find out there's interviews with this person, that person. And um, I first started going through George Rousseau's because that was the person who had been credited. And after I, I got the pages and I kind of realized in a few months what I had, I contacted the guy that sold them to me. And I was like, Do you, where did you get these? He's like, oh, I bought these at a Sotheby's auction in 1991. I think he said maybe 92. And I'm like, do you know where they came from? And he's like, I, I believe they came from Jerry Robinson's collection. Or he said George Rousseau's collection. And I was like, oh, what would have been George Rousseau's? And um, so then I found out that Jerry Robinson, aside from being a huge advocate for creator's rights, was the guy that actually settled the deal for Siegel and Schuster on a midnight phone call with a Warner Brothers lawyer. The fuck, really? In 1975, when um, Neil Adams had taken up the cause with Jerry Schuster, and Jerry was on The Tonight Show, and Robinson was doing – syndicated strips he's one of the first guys to set up um a worldwide syndication cartooning network in the 70s as well he had presented work for the um 
the Society of <coughs> Illustrators in, in New York City. He had taught at um, School of Visual Arts before it was SVA. What did they call it? It was the um, Cartoonists and Illustration Academy, I think. Jesus Christ. And um, that was started by Bern Hogarth, who I then would like study under at Art Center, taking like guerrilla education classes up at Art Center in the early 90s. Fucking nice. He's a character and a half. But the, um, and then I found out Robinson and Eisner and had set up a, um, this traveling salon where they would go out and talk about illustration and comics and that they brought in Bern Hogarth. This is 1950s. Jesus. Where they've got their live drawing and Bern Hogarth's fine artist. Um, and they would be connecting the fine art roots of comic book art in the 1950s. So this guy seems like the type who's done a lot of work on behalf of other people and not taken a lot of credit for the things that he's done himself. But he swore that he had developed the Joker. He was 18 years old. He was working for Bob Kane. He was going to Columbia University where he met his wife. And he was taking a writing class. And so in that, that run where he's working on Batman and then Batman and Robin, this is April of 1940 is the cover date on Detective Comics number 38, the first appearance of Robin. Mm. The That's where he's date. jumping through the, the character find of the century. Yep. And, um, and he credited um, Bill Finger for saying that we need a kid, we need a sidekick. And um, that he named the character Robin and he worked on the suit and it was all from an illustrated book by N.C. Wyeth of um, Robin Hood and his name's Robinson. So it's like, oh, well, it's, oh, Robin, it's a real guy's name. You know, it, it shouldn't be like a superhero because we want to connect with teenagers and he was still a teenager himself. That was the idea? Yeah. And so he draws Robin and he gets credit for creating Robin, but not really, you know, until years and years later. Right. And um, so they get the go ahead because Superman had just gone from action comics into Superman, his own title. Uh -huh. And they wanted to do this with Batman because Batman was a big hit too. So they get this, um, they find out that they're going to be needing to do four new stories for Batman number one. And so Jerry says to, um, to Bill and Bob, well, hey, I, I'm, I'm taking a writing class at Columbia. I'd like to be able to write and draw a story. And they're like, great, one less thing for us to do. And Bill Finger was a great writer, but he was very slow. So they were happy to see this happen. So in this writing class, they're teaching about, um, you know, duality, and um, conflict mm. in fiction. And so he, he figures there's no super villains for these superheroes. You know, everybody thus far in comics has been like a gangster. It's like Superman taking on gangsters. Right. It's like the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like how impressive is that? Not it was too like they're watching the $6 million man when we were kids. Yeah. It's like the guy's got bionics all over him. He's fighting normal people. Yeah. And then finally they're like, Bigfoot. Big <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then spoilers, he's bionic too. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> yeah. you melted my mind. Yeah. I, I think my head spun around in circles. <laughs> but the, um, I found out you know, that, that, he's, that he's like, well, we need a super villain. He's like, well, what would be great would be if there's this villain who's um, – you're not as serious as Batman, like a villain with a sense of humor. And the word that sticks in his head is Joker because his, his family play cards. So he, he's in his apartment. He's now in New York City, so he's not living in his, his parents' house in New Jersey. He grew up in, um, in, I think, Park Slope. Of course, before it was called Park Slope. Right. And then um, the family got some money, moved out of New York, moved to New Jersey. And so he was staying at an aunt's house while he was going to Columbia. And um, Bob Kane was from the Bronx. When you look at the cityscapes in Batman and that shadow and stuff, it grows out of um, his dad's owning a movie theater and him really connecting with German Expressionist cinema and Bill Finger pushing him even further in that direction. Bill Finger was a huge fan of German Expressionist cinema. And um, he's always been, they've always credited in the official canon of the creation of the Joker yeah. that Bill Finger was a huge fan of the movie The Man Who Laughs. Yeah, that's what I've, the story of I have always heard. Right. So the um, this is how it kind of takes shape is that. Jerry comes to them with this idea that he wants to do this, this character. And he comes up with this drawing he had did of a Joker card. And this has been, it's a relatively famous piece. It's been museum exhibited. It's Jerry Robinson's drawing of the Joker. And that becomes the card that the Joker leaves at the sign, at the scenes of his crimes. And um, it's very much a card playing Joker. And Bill and, and Bob are like, okay, this is too good, kid. We're going to have Bill Finger write this because we don't want your first um, writing assignment here to be this character. So why don't you hand it over to Bill? Bill's great. And reluctantly, and I think Jerry 
being an 18 year old kid probably cried about this, you know, that, well, this is my character. This is like, my, yeah, I came up with this. But Bill was also like, he considered Bill his mentor and he's like, well, Bill do a great job with it. So sure. So Bill writes it, Jerry draws it. Um, they refine the character from his Harlequin kind of Joker yeah, into and the this drawing man who here, He looks more like a, a, a circus right. kind of, there was an episode of Batman the Animated Series where they did the Joker was in disguise and he kind of looked like this type of clown, a circus clown with yeah. like the bald makeup Which and the nose and shit. Also, end up doing the Dark Knight movie. Interestingly enough, isn't that weird? Yeah. yeah. But the um, the story, as I had heard it from George Rousseau, was that he remembered the character starting out as a Harlequin and then getting refined down to this this other thing. Mm. So, Batman number one doesn't have four new stories; it has three new stories because. Jerry was supposed to write his story, but he doesn't get to write it. And Bill doesn't have enough ideas. So they grab a Hugo Strange story that was supposed to be in Detective mm -hmm. and they push that into the fourth story slot. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, this is, this is the official story. And, and Bob Kane fought it, you know, tooth and nail his entire life. No, because I think at this point saying he had to admit that Bill Finger had written everything because there's so many witnesses around at the time. Everybody right. fought for it. And Jerry Robinson fought for Bill's credit. He fought for them to give that uh, award out at Comic-Con, the Bill Finger Award for writing comics. And um, that he had to kind of relent. And then he even said that he felt bad that he, he felt bad that he had slighted Bill for so long, you know, in, in the connection with the story. And I think as people get older and they kind of want to wash away their sins if they think they're going to die. <laughs> but aka even bob kane had a soul <laughs> by the end even bob kane but you know also that um someone might be willing to split credit with one other person but to split it in three really belittles their legacy if they feel like they have a legacy for the character so you think he got left he got left behind for that reason? so i think he left jerry behind for that and i don't think i think jerry was well set up at that point too jerry had um, syndicated strips. He had won um, a ton of awards. He had had art exhibitions. There was actually in, in 1969, um, one of Jerry's strips, which was like this um, borderless one panel political cartoon that he did a series of. Um, he did a, a collaged piece in a pop art exhibition alongside Roy Lichtenstein. Oh my God. And there's a photograph of Jerry, Roy and Jerry's daughter at this exhibition standing in front of this piece that, that Jerry had done. I mean, he was, Jerry was not a guy who sat back and um, did nothing. I mean, he, he made his own projects and he built up a reputation. He was teaching at, at, at this point, probably four different schools. Mm -hmm. He taught at SVA for 10 years in its previous incarnation and continue to foster new relationships. His students, by the way, um, you know, no one too famous, you know, Let's maybe. Hear it. <laughs> Maybe just, you know, the guy that co-created Spider-Man. Steve Ditko? Steve Ditko was a student of Jerry Robinson. There's another guy I thought was an old man when he was working in comics, but he was a kid? Yeah. Jesus. And Don Heck, co-creator of Iron Man. Get out of here. Marie Severin. Oh, my God. Jack Abel. He taught all these people. Yeah, they were all his students. And a lot of them ended up working with him, too, later when he set up his, his syndication. And that's why I think that Steve what is, Ditko was happy to leave. syndication. What is that? So syndication would be people that would work on strips and they get placed in newspapers around the world. So name a strip that they would work on. Oh, well, um, one of the strips that they were working on, there was two that Jerry wrote himself. And I actually have to, I have to think back on that for a second. But, um, but not like Spider-Man, Batman. No, but like King Syndicate is the, right. the company that runs like Little Abner. And, yeah. and you know almost everything you read in, say, the Boston Globe Sunday, the New York Times Sunday. So all of those, those little comic strips are syndicated features. They don't work directly for the paper that publishes it. The paper buys the rights to keep publishing this particular comic. Right. So even things like Bloom County and, you know, Honestly, I can't think of anything newer than Bloom County as far as a strip, you know, but Family Circus, whatever, um, Bizarro, Far Side, those are all syndicated strips. Mm. What Jerry did is he started contacting foreign newspapers and marketing the, the strips that they were working on that he created and that the people in his, his bullpen, if you will, were creating and marketing them for Spanish newspapers and French newspapers and uh. English newspapers. And his son, um, Jens, went to school in England and helped open up the English publishing market for these syndicated pieces. 
Jens um, still works for um, an international comic, um, comic art, mm-hmm. um, like publicity agency, as, as far as I know. And so he's getting like all these people involved in things and he's got his own career. So he, he didn't necessarily care. He saw there was no money in having your name on the property at that point anyways, because he had just fought to get money for Siegel and Schuster in the 1970s. Right. So by the time the Batman movies roll around, he's like, well, I've already been through this and you know, I'm never, I'm not going to get a piece of it. I know Bob Kane, Bob's always fought me on this. So there's no, there's nothing in it for me. They still of course invited him to the, um, the films when the when the second set of Batman movies came out, he got to see um, the um, the first and second um, Christian mm-hmm. Bale films. But um, this contention that he had created the character Which must have stung to see the fucking second one because he's like, Ooh. "Hey man, that's my my Joker." Not only is that my Joker, but my gosh, you know that's the the mask he's wearing is much more. It's a darker, more kind of insane clown posse version of like the same type of clown that's in this page that I own. Yeah. So I'm also thinking like, if it was a prelim, why did he hang on to it so long? You know, he got rid of it in the late eighties or early nineties for it to go up to Sotheby's to generate money for a charity. And he probably went back into this box of stuff that he had mm. and thumbed through them and saw the fronts and didn't even think. And didn't it. even think about it and just lifted a whole pile of them, stuck them in an envelope and mailed them off for um, someone to sell for charity. And really it might be comic history because the thesis here is Jerry Robinson, your visual proof created the Joker. Yes. I mean, that's a barn burner, no? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And like, it took so long to fall into place. And the credibility of that story is high because just a minute ago, they were like, all right, Bill Finger is involved in Batman as well. Yeah. And that had everything to do with Bob Kane, the way I understand it. Yeah. With the Kane estate. It's not so much DC and stuff. It was like. It was Kane. It, yeah. Like our deal. He signed a deal that was fucking ironclad, says we can't do jack or shit. And forever he is Batman's creator and blah, blah, blah. Nobody else can. So it took a lot of, took years and fucking a lot of wrangling and stuff. But now. You know, they say, hey, created, but also created by or whatever. There's specific language to it. Yeah. But it's, I don't know the inside, but I bet you it's not a, it's a no money deal. Yeah. Like, you know, we'll give them the credit, but, you know, it's the math is too much for us. <laughs> so for Siegel and Schuster, it was, it was health care. Is that what they got them? Yeah. That, that, um, they were ill and they needed the health insurance and they did end up getting some money, but it was a buyout. Mm. So they were unable to revisit that deal. But the um, as I kept looking at these, I kept thinking like, okay, now even at that time, you know, the fact that they're inked, why were they inked? And either George or Jerry must have realized what they had. You think so? Because 1940, you don't see a lot of preliminary pages. One of the reasons why you don't is they were huge World War, World War II paper drives. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason why the Mummy movie poster is worth more than Frankenstein or Dracula, even though it's far less of a film, mm. is because almost all of those those posters went into paper drives during World War II. Wow. Now, the artists that were working on comics in 1938, 39, 40, 41 saw the price of illustration board go up because paper was being relegated for military use. So they would just erase the pencils on pages and reuse the page. They'd never ink a page that wasn't going to get published because their deadlines were so on point. Right. So here I've got a page that is inked on both sides, which is really, really weird. And while some of those panels were used for the story that appears in Batman 11, it makes you think again, okay, well, they clearly used these panels. Why didn't they use this, this illustration board? Unless there was a conscious effort thinking, hold on to this. We need to keep this separate. Like this has to exist on its own. Like this may be, and I don't know that they'd be thinking of some kind of proof already at that point. Right, but just like this is kind of, I was here first. Yeah, there's something special. We need to reserve this, you know, that this needs to be remembered at a certain point. And that to me comes full circle back to that Simon and Simon episode. <laughs> this is a good poll. Watching this 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 mystery on a on a detective show on CBS that ran after Magnum PI talk about something that can only be solved in the pages of the comic book. And in this case, this is a page that solves a piece of not just, you know, history about the dedication 
the attribution of a title of creator to somebody. Mm. But more importantly, that when Jerry Robinson was developing the Robin character, he was also already kind of thinking about the Joker. And weaving him right into the fucking origin. And this makes it appear as though the Joker was an imperative portion of That's what it reads like, yeah. The creation of of Robin as this this boy sidekick to to Batman, which changes the whole canon. I mean, you know, I was reading somewhere about they X rayed the Mona Lisa again. And they, they find something underneath it? Yeah, they find the um the self portrait of Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> what? Under the Mona Lisa. Leonardo da Vinci? Sorry. I, just, I, just, I, I was like, this, holy shit. <laughs> I just made you've this, cracked the universe in two. <laughs> I just made the same mistake that Art News made la- like two weeks ago. That um, da Vinci had, had done a self-portrait and then painted the Mona Lisa on top of it. Really? But this page to me is like if you x-rayed the Mona Lisa and saw a photograph of Salvador Dali winking at you. <laughs> like, like that it's so anachronistic yeah. and it so much changes the, the way that you have to look at things and that it's not just um, a piece of art that affects the world of fiction, that it has this real world impact, this real world connotation. And um, so I've been slowly over time kind of building up the reputation of this page because I figure – it's it's incredibly important. It could be very beneficial to Jerry Robinson, who was so good to every artist in his in his orbit, and mm. wasn't a guy who took a lot of credit for himself. That this needs to happen, and that um, just as it needed to happen for Marvel to finally give Jack Kirby credit, but that also if a a, a Todd McFarlane Spider Man cover sells at auction for almost seven hundred thousand dollars, what is this? Yeah, like what kind of price can you put on this? It's there's nothing else like it in a in an industry of unique things where there are pages that only exist as what they are. This stands out as a unicorn among unicorns. And it also might be proof of one of the greatest crimes in comic book history. Yeah. And the a copyright infringement or, or just, you know, leaving the credit off the table that it, it was a crime. It, it's definitely a crime that that this incredibly talented guy didn't get his due. Is there anybody in his world to confirm it? Like who he's how old? 18, 19. He was 18 years old. Was he married? Who are his contemporaries? He didn't get married until 1955. Wally Wood and Tatiana Wood were the, uh, were at his wedding. Wally Wood was his best man. That's adorable. Um, he's got kids. Um, I've, I mean, obviously they're not, you can't ask them. You, you need somebody who was around. Like what about right. Russo's? He's passed as Russo's well. Russo's is gone too. So there's like four people that know the truth. Mm -hmm. This is like some fucking national treasure type bullshit. Four people that know the truth, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. Bob Kane, Bill Finger, Jerry Robinson. There's an editor, too, that changed the story in the first um, Batman. Who was it? A guy named um, Whitley. Also gone. Yeah, I'm sure. If he was an editor in, in 1940... This is like, um, it's like a t- akin to the Shroud of Turin. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if you believe, you're like, Jesus Christ. And like, yeah. yes, that's who it is. But, you know, you know, there'd be a, it, it behooves the establishment mm-hmm. to not even entertain the notion. But also there's, there's this interesting um, piece of fandom. And it's kind of, it's like the dark side of fandom. That I remember when when people were saying, "Hey, you know, it's only right that Jack Kirby gets credit." There was a bunch of fans, which it just boggled my mind, that seemed to not want to give Kirby credit too. Like, oh, well, he signed a deal, blah blah. blah. It's like number one, you don't know what deal he signed. Right. You know, trolls. Yeah, do on you the look internet. at the paperwork? Yeah, but the um, and that the the statutes and the the terminology and contracts of those days would act would absolutely support ownership. But you get judges that are going to side with 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 large corporations every once in a while. And just the budget that they have to hammer people with with more paperwork. Yeah, you fucking money out of it, man. You know, but that there's fans that also just don't want to believe that anything that goes against what they hold sacred is is true. And so I had uh, mentioned a little bit about this on on my my pop sequentialism blog, um, which had grown out of that exhibition and then turned into the podcast years ago. And I got contacted by a former editor of mine. Um, at forces a geek who is like, oh, don't you think that's a stretch? And I'm like, I don't know. You got to really look at the the full picture. And he's like, yeah. well, if it was done for Batman 11, then it's clearly done later than than it would have been 
published. I'm like, well, that's not how it went down, though. You're thinking about how people work now. In in the days in 1939, 1940, when these guys were working in, in studios, you'd be working sometimes months ahead of, of when something was going to come out. And then you might get lazy and miss a deadline and go grab a page and pull it out and just put new words on it. Right. Kirby did that all the time. Kirby would plot entire issues of stuff in the 1960s that just had, that had no writing. And if he had two pages that went together and Stan came in and looked at it, didn't feel like writing in the word balloon in that next page, he'd pull the page out of the pile. He'd only fill in the word balloons that he wanted to, hand it off, and maybe that page made it into the next, the next issue instead. <laughs> I mean, that stuff happened constantly. Right. They and were so, working a machine, man. They were making coloring books, dude. They were. They weren't sitting there going like, this is comic book history. They were just going like, this is product. We got to fill. We got orders to do. We're they on had, the clock. They had no sense of history about that stuff while it was happening. They were creating history. Right. And especially, you know, that first group of people, you know, your Seagulls and Schusters and, and Kane and Finger and, and Robinson and Rousseau's and Dick Sprang and the guys that came out in those very – Will Eisner, those guys. I mean it was a brand new medium. There had been strips, but binding a comic book was a different thing. And people like Jerry and Will were really fighting to change even just the layout so that they could do splash pages. Mm. And they could do interesting um, – you know breaking the mold, not doing a nine panel page, but having, you know, these, these special panels. And you see Steranko really embrace that in the 1960s after Will Eisner. And you see that Jerry Robinson was doing it too. And he was working for Charles Biro and all these other publishers as well. So um, unless you have the context of, of how to look at it, it's really hard to kind of unravel it all. And I do really feel like that if that clown isn't a proto, prototypical joker, um, or isn't the Joker, it is a prototype of the Joker. Mm -hmm. And since it is from the same pen as the man who created Robin, he was absolutely thinking about this at a certain point and before the point in the publication history where the Joker becomes the Joker that we know. So that historically it's still a very important um, piece, but that it absolutely lends credence to the argument that this appears before the appearance of the Joker. Fuck, dude. It's nuts. Yeah. That is nuts. And and just like what a fucking captivating piece of comic book mystery. Mm -hmm. Nobody can confirm it, mm -hmm. but who to fucking deny it? And like right. your forensic science on it is kind of impeccable. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, like, you know, well, I filled this part in myself. Like, You've kind of gone through it. Everything's been deduced and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's dangerous to make a leap that especially when you're trying to create provenance for something that, that could be very, very valuable, right. not just in terms of of money or resale value, but that it's it's important to people's lives and it's important to the way they think about things. That It's very dangerous to make a leap that you can't make with some kind of secondary um, verification. Mm. And everything that I've pieced together comes from something that's out there already, you know, interviews from things as recent as the comics journal and things as old as, um, special industry publications for the society of New York illustrators, Whoa, you know, that type of stuff that, um, that you can track these down, that there have been on camera interviews with people that were in and that are in the extended family of, of Jerry Robinson and others. So that it's, it's pretty well, it's out there and that it just takes somebody to kind of edit and put it together. And I've done this much and obviously would hope that if there's anybody else that has um, information that they can add to the puzzle, that we can extend it because it's Fuck most it, important. Dude, there's got to be somebody listening out there, man. Motherfuckers listen to Serial, that podcast. <laughs> this is, I mean, maybe this isn't as important as a man's life in prison hangs in the balance, <laughs> but like a lot of amateur sleuths out there listening, yeah. man. If they can lend a hand, where do they find? Yeah, they can. If they can open it up, that'd be great. And shoot me an email for sure. Where is that? Um, info at lalusdehezus.com or um, info at popsequentialism.com. You're going to put it up? You're going to display it at any point? Have you displayed it yet? I haven't displayed it yet. I mean, there's there's been, honestly, the amount of people who have seen this in person since I've owned it. I mean, I, I don't know how many people saw it right. over the decades, but um, you're talking like, six people what about permanent display in in the gallery 
I well, mean, shit, that'd send fucking a bunch of people would be like, I got to see this. I would, I'd rather it go into a museum. Right. Well, you you, know? you kind of got, well, a gallery is a museum. We to me, do, but, but it's, it's hard to display double-sided pieces. Right. So you need like lucite glass. Yeah. And have to hang in the middle of the room. Hang in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Um, fuck. Like, like young Indiana Jones said, dude, this belongs in a museum. <laughs> like it's, it might be a fucking very important part of of everything we know and love yeah. about these characters, man. And it doesn't make anything worse. It makes everything better. Yeah. It enriches it a little bit. Mm-hmm. I always thought that the man who laughed at Origin was just like, all right, so you saw a movie and ripped it off. But, you know, this, a little more poetic, right? Yeah. Like, well, playing cards were always a big thing in my family. Mm-hmm. That's fucking some tremendous sleuthing, dude. Oh, thanks. That is fucking 70s detective show level sleuthing. Beretta. Like, yes. It's right up there with the greats. Um, fucking A, man. What a fucking journey you took us on, dude. You took us through young Los Angeles geekdom mm-hmm. all the way back to fucking the origins of the Joker himself, as well as Robin. That is fantastic content, dude. I told you, every time you fucking talk about this, you got to fucking come yeah. in and talk. Well, thanks for having me on. Astounding story, dude. Like and and every part of this makes me so happy because fucking your life journey story is interesting enough. And then we were like, okay, here's the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's about fucking did Jerry Robbins who create the Joker. It's like, it's like exit through the gift start. Gift yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was about Banksy. All your references are on point, but <laughs> um right on, man. Fucking god damn it. You're my new best friend in the world, dude. Fucking awesome. you lived the life I wanted to live. <laughs> <laughs> and and boy your commitment to the fucking genre like it you're a man and look where it's taken you you know like when i was a kid and probably when you were a kid maybe not so much the world you lived in but where i was like oh god they were like why are you looking at this stuff this is for fucking kids Same or thing. in the 80s and 90s this is fucking gay or, yeah. or something like that Look at what passion for ridiculousness. Like, yeah, all right, fucking the idea of motherfucker putting on tights and beating somebody up for justice is kind of, you know, maybe juvenile to some. But fucking passion for that, interest in that, and simple morality tale dressed up, or, you know, fucking isn't any different than Greek mythology or something like that, our version of such. Somewhere there's a photograph of me dressed like Bob Violence at BossCon 1986 in a costume that my mom hand sewed for me. Oh, my God. So I have to believe somewhere, somewhere that the geeks will inherit the earth. I mean, dude, it took, look how far it took you. Yeah. Look, it's uh, your whole life's adventure is predicated on loving this shit. Mm-hmm. And it led you into a bunch of different fucking rooms. Mm-hmm. Like, not just like, and I worked at the post office for 30 years because I liked Batman. Like, yeah. you, you've done a fuck ton of shit more shit than people do in a fucking lifetime like most people do one thing you wore a bunch of fucking hats man mm-hmm. and all because you were like i like this stuff took you on the great journey right across the country most people are like rabbits they're gonna leave where they grew up near and stuff but you found a way to make a go of it i didn't come to los angeles until like you know i was married money and fucking like i was dragging here and stuff you're part of that generation that is like well let's see what's out there and you helped build what was fucking out there mm-hmm. It's awesome, man. You've been a fantastic fucking guest. Thanks. Um, anytime, anytime. Oh my god, this we can go deep. Where can they hear you on regularly? Do you do you pod regularly? Yep. Um, every Sunday, a new um, pod sequentialism drops. We got it on iTunes. Um, I think it's also on SoundCloud, and it's available through the Meltdown Comics Network. And um, yeah, you know, we we open a new show on the first Friday of every month at Lalu's Day Zoo. What is next? The next show is we've got we've got our two rock stars. We've got uh, Jessica Adams um, from Scarling and from uh, Jack Off Jill, and she's showing with Lindsay Way. Um, you know Lindsay's Gerard's from, yeah Gerard, lady yep Linz yep she's doing a show yeah she's amazing. Um, they're very artsy. <laughs> they're they're he's, great. He, couple. Have you been look? Oh, he's I fucking adore him. He's yeah. they. I mean, she was super nice to my kid when she went to see her show. Of course, I always appreciate that. But he's one of my favorite people on the planet. He's awesome. He was. He went he to SVA. And she he, went to Pratt. Yes. Dude. Oh, totally one of us. So much like when you sit there and talk to him, you're like, yeah. oh my god. And he'll tell you too. He's just like, you know, I was a fucking fat kid. Like he was definitely one of us. He yeah. Just fucking trimmed up and shit, but. 
man, he's an art kid. Like yep. you look at his Instagram, it's so f- joyous with fucking like collar yeah. things, drawing, like, you know, not just mine's a series of like pictures of me. <laughs> his is art and shit like that. So when is the show? Uh, that show? show's going to be the first Friday. In... What kind of piece is she doing? She's, she actually found a bunch of old letters that she had written in her diary and journal and she's done accented drawings on top of these original drawings. It's kind of it's a really raw kind of like oh my God. teen angst show, and you get to look back at it as an adult and you know feel things about that. But um, I just love the work that she's done. It, it's it's again, it's like kind of what's her her band? Um, her band is Mindless Self Indulgence. Mindless Self Indulgence yep. says it. Yeah, with Jimmy Urin, and um, yeah, just fabulous stuff. I've I've been aware of her work, and she's actually quite well known for these dioramas that she makes these large three-dimensional dioramas and this is a very very different body of work i'm really happy about it um her portion of the show is called shitty teen <laughs> which i love <laughs> so good oh my god when one more time is the um, third time i'm saying it. the first friday of next month of february yep fucking totally going and so it's on all month yep and then we've got our, our annual group show the la Luza palooza where we bring in the new new artists alongside you know well known artists and, and everything's up for that. sale too you can buy shit yeah um yeah that's the only depressing part of ever going to that place is seeing little red dots on things like, <laughs> fuck you should be on the preview list yeah i mean i don't know that's like i like going in with the great unwashed you know what i'm saying privilege mm-hmm. breeds content well not privileged but i mean we actually send the preview out to anybody who signs up for it honestly oh, All right. but um so in. yeah so it gives you an opportunity to buy uh with anybody else who would too then i would have had that glen bar piece back in the yeah, house that glen bar piece is, is pretty dope is it glen bar glen bar yeah i think it is because one two print, ends two r's that's the, there's one print i have where the the g maybe looks like an o to me or something like that Could be. i was always calling him glen bar people are always correcting me going glen bar you dick God, I fucking love that dude's work. I've loved so much of the work that he put up on his play. I'm I'm taking my kid to see that show, man. Yeah. That's fucking tremendous. I mean, just uh, the season to see the work. I mean, you know, I don't have to creep the chick out and be like, hi. But like, you know, it stays on display for like a good month. Yep, it's up all month. There's a couple pieces in the back hallway, which I love those fucking Disney sex pieces. Oh, Jose Rodolfo Luisa Ontiveros. Holy we- fuck, you are a gallery owner. You remember the fucking dude's full name. Well done. Tell him what they are, those pieces. Oh, he does the the kissing Disney princesses. <laughs> and he's always done well. And it's funny is that um, he got retweeted by Katy Perry and Lady Gaga a lot. Right. And then last year during the LA Art Show, um, he got retweeted by Madonna and everything we had sold. Really? Yeah. And we've got, I think, there's, we have two pieces in the hallway now that were produced after that. And we have access to one amazing older piece, which is um, Bambi's mom getting mounted by another deer in front of all of the other like Disney forest animals. Right. And that deer is getting mounted by another deer. <laughs> Genius. Um, art, man, just mm-hmm. makes you fucking happy. Mm-hmm. Life of art. That's what Matt Kennedy here is at. And boy, it's taking him fucking places, including right into the heart of a fucking mystery that affects us all. The show's called fat man on Batman. And we fucking talked about Batman, son. Maybe a little too much <laughs> in terms of people being like, wait a second, you just shattered the universe. Um, you're doing the Lord's work over there. Thank you. Go see that gallery, folks, in California. If you're out here in Los Angeles, if you haven't seen it yet, you fucking, by the end of the show, you better go see it. I guarantee you pick up a bunch of listeners off of this. Oh, I awesome. could sit here and listen to you fucking talk all day. Oh, thank like, you. Like, you swear, it. I, this sounds so fucking cliche to say. <laughs> and I'm always baked, so I can't blame this. I'm like, I'm high, but like, you're like a brother from another mother, man. Absolutely. You're like the older brother I wish I had, or the fucking twin brother I wish I had, where it's like, <laughs> my brother's always doing cool shit. Like, now he works at Trauma. Now he fucking does this. Mm-hmm. Jesus, dude, you spun a lot of plates, man. You keep doing it. Fucking awesome. Um, there it is, folks. Uh, for Fat Man on Batman, uh, I've been Kevin Smith, man. Uh, tune in next week. Same fat time. Same fat channels. Modcast.com. This has been a production of Smodco Internet Radio. Sir, only at Smodcast.com.